Hey, welcome back, guys. My guest today, I, I didn't even, I was just talking to him beforehand. I didn't even know how to introduce him. His story is so interesting, and it is it goes in so many different places. So I'm just going to bring him on. Mickey Mace, what is going on, man? What's happening? I'm, I'm happy to have you out here, man. I, I've been talking to Brandy about you. We had Brandy Andrews on here a, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I, I did some research, and it is it just one of the most fascinating stories that I've ever seen. And the controversy that goes along with it, it just like, it, it's, it's this whirlwind that seems to kind of follow you around, and it's really interesting. Interesting. I want to. I, I don't even know where to start. Let's start with this. Uh, you initially, in the several of the stories, talk about being homeless or couch surfing. Can you talk about that whole situation? What What were the the life? Just so we can get like the rag to riches kind of story. What were the circumstances that led to that initially to where you were homeless? Yeah, sure. So I was actually born into an affluent family, right? Yeah. Like I was born into a rich family. Yeah. And I had mentioned in, in another interview at some point. Um, that my family had owned casinos like before my time. I will say that a lot of people confuse that chain of events. Mm -hmm. It was my grandfather's brother who had found him way to have a piece of a casino in London like 70 years ago, a short term, and he lost his shares mm. as a degenerate gambler. So I, my people think like, oh, my family owns these casinos in Vegas. And like that's part of this marketing or something. It's not accurate. So I was born into a fit. When I was born, my family had money. My family, I'm Jewish. My family's Holocaust survivors. And every generation since being in America following the Holocaust, they had made tremendous success and also lost it. And the following generation, it started over. So I'm now fourth generation, my great grandfather. So not many of my family members survived the war. Right. Mm. Uh, most of them, you know, murdered and, and, and you know, what have you. And when they came here, my great grandfather, uh, he had been completely poor. They lived in the ghettos in Poland. They were sponsored and came over here. Uh, they started, they built, then um, lost everything basically at the end of my great-grandfather's life. So then my grandfather and my great-uncle, they started over. And uh, they started, uh, they were builders and things like this and entrepreneurs in general. And they built pretty great success, lost everything. So then came my father and his yeah. brother, which is my uncle. Then they started over on their own. Uh, my father started with a um, home improvement company and like, you know, like an old beat up pickup truck. He went around and like fixed up whatever he could, you know, sheetrock, paint, whatever. And he slowly built that up over his whole life, became a big builder, um, got himself in some situations, lost everything, started over. Can, can, I, can I stop you real quick? So yeah. for a lot of people who haven't seen any other interviews that you've done, because I, I understand why you're saying this, this is sort of a response to this belief that you weren't homeless or the fact that you came from affluence and that's the reason why. Like, because, because one of the issues, and we're going to get into this, is that a lot of the stories that you, that, that you talk about, they come off as just so outside of three standard deviations outside the norm, right? That's what yeah. they come off as. And so people have a hard time believing them. And so that's why you're sitting there talking about where this affluence came from. Trust me, I understand to some extent because I, you know, I run a, a, a coaching program and everyone thinks that the stuff I do is fake. Not everyone, but a lot of people do. And I have to, I have a similar situation. So uh, it's, so when you, with the homelessness, um, this is a thing where you, you're explaining that it's not your fam. When you said you came from a family that had casinos, that doesn't mean that that's where you specifically came from. You have relatives, distant relatives that had that. Right, right. Okay, so now from that standpoint, you talk about couch surfing or whatever, mm -hmm. and then let, let's just I mean, we're gonna we're gonna get to the point where we, you know you're beating casinos at Baccarat. That's the reason why you you end, ended up getting famous. Um, can you talk about the ascension? What are the things that happen? I know and eventually you end up working in a rehab clinic. You end up working with a pharmacy. How does that whole thing work? Yeah, so, okay. So uh, I know something we spoke about off air is you yeah. want to talk about, I started selling drugs when I was 11. Yes, yeah. So to, to be exactly specific, it was I was 12, actually. I started using drugs when I was 11. Yeah. So I started uh, selling drugs when I was 12, roughly the same time that like my dad started to lose everything. Okay. I... At the time, even now, looking back, I'm not sure there's a direct correlation between the issues that were happening with my family and the family's business and, and all, all of this you know, stuff that was happening and me acting out and behaving certain ways. I don't really know if there's a direct relation. I can tell you that I was always like a reckless kid. Yeah. I was always really wild and uh, big. Like, you know, they always say like, oh, 
Mick, you shouldn't hang out with so-and-so. They're a bad influence. I was the bad influence. Well, well Mickey, I, I would tell you there's a high probability that is probably what happened. I mean, there's very few people that would say that that it doesn't have anything to do with your upbringing, right? Mm -hmm. when, you, when you look at studies, uh, the book behind you, Evolutionary Psychology well, by Dr. David Buss, one of the things they talk about, not specifically in that one, is but it, with upbringing, the majority of it is genetic, and then the rest of it has to do with like the people that you hang out with. And the, the least part, and a lot of people don't like to hear this, is parenting. Parenting actually has the least amount of influence on how somebody ends up turning out. You end up seeing these mothers that end up, you know, their kid goes to jail for something and it's like, no, my baby was really good. Or they try to send their kid to a really, really good uh, private school or whatever. It makes no difference. A lot of, so much of it has to do with the upbringing and the surrounding. Before we go on, I forgot, Brandy, I did not introduce you before. This is Brandy Andrews. She's back here on the show as well. And uh, Brandy, yes, Brandy, Brandy, everybody loved your episode. So I'm really glad that you, uh, you. you came back on here. I thought it was, uh, it was really, it was, it was really funny because there were a lot of people like didn't sit through it. And then when I, when they did, they were like, holy fucking shit. I had people tell me, I don't know who Brandy Andrews is, but I love her. I've had several people tell me that. So your episode, I think really touched a lot of people, especially when it had to do with suicide. We've had Ellie, um, Ellie Harding on here, Ellie Harding on here. And she talked about uh, similar topics. So really, really awesome. And I, you're friends with Mickey. And I thought that you probably would have a different perspective on some of the questions that were asked. Uh, and if you have any, just shoot them out and okay. let me know. Okay. Um, so here we are in a situation where, you know, you're selling drugs. Uh, you, you said you're using drugs at 11, you're selling drugs at 12, and you were the bad influence, right? Do you think that there was some, was there somebody in your life early on that kind of led you in that direction? Was there somebody that maybe you admired? Was there an influence that you had when you were younger, a movie you saw or something to that, that effect? I mean, I was always the youngest kid in the group, always yeah. growing up. You know, I was, you know, um, 13 and all my friends were, you know, 18, 19, 20, and they saw me as an equal. And I think I just really wanted to feel accepted and wanted to be a part of that. And whether it was them or somebody else, I don't know. I just remember the feeling looking at these like cool older kids and their cool cars and all the girls and all this. And I'm like, wow, these guys like me. They call me every day to come hang out. Like this is what we're doing today. We're going to the mall, we're going here and doing this. And I think, I don't know what it was that it was them. It might've been that they just like matched my energy like as far as being like wild and rambunctious and a troublemaker. But when I felt acceptance from them, I was like, I remember that feeling and I was like, this is tight. Because like, they were oh. older and you felt them to be higher status. Yeah. And the, so that was the influence. These were like, yeah, these were like hardcore kids. Uh, we weren't living in the ghetto. Uh, but as far as like my like county goes, these kids were like infamous. And uh, somehow, you know, they were a part of every wild story that took place. in This the, in New Jersey? This is in New Jersey, okay. yeah. They were a part of like every wild story of every crazy scenario that was taking place in that county. If there was something going down, it was that group of guys. And... Uh, and I was that group of guys, and it was cool. I grew up around some drug dealers, and we went to some keggers, and so it was, it was you know, just typical, like, um, was it All Right, All Right? What's the, the Matthew McConaughey movie? Days and Confused, is that the one? I'm trying to remember, or I, I can't remember which one it was, but that was kind of like what, what it was like for me growing up in Texas. What was the, when you say the stuff they were into, what are you talking about? Um, I just, like, I have this one faint memory. Uh -huh. We're at this kid's house. Um, he was like a... He was really poor, to be honest. He lived in a, a shack with his sister and his mother. They had no money. They didn't even have a... None of them could afford a cell phone, and they didn't have a phone in the house. So there's no way to contact. Mm -hmm. So we would just pull up on the house, you know? And the truth is, he was always home because he was actually a bum. Yeah. As an adult now, I can look back and say, you know, these, some of these kids were bums. Some of them were just what, what it may be. But at the time, it looked cool. I remember, so his mother used to let us do anything we wanted. Yeah. So they were just like on this little piece of property, picnic table... As many people that wanted, anybody who pulled up to the house, that's who was there. You know, if 100 yeah. people, 10 people, 24 hours a day, and there was a shed in the back that was like retrofitted to like have a couple of couches and like some subwoofers. And I remember I must have been, I must have been 13, and uh, we're like, you know, we're like doing pills, doing blow, and there's all these girls. Mind you, I'm 13, the girls are probably 15, 16, and the guy's like 18 to 20, right? Yeah. Looking back, I see how wrong everything was. But yeah. I, at 13, like, I felt on top of the world at this moment. And they took me into the shed because that's where we that's where the more intimate part of the party was gravitating. So we went from the, the table into the shed, and it was the first time I ever heard uh, Lil Wayne's I Feel Like Dying, right? Okay. But it was the version that plays in reverse. So I'm super high. I'm tripping out. And at 13, even though I'd been doing drugs, at 13, the experience of the drugs are different than they had became as a young adult, you know, mm. after so many years. So I still felt new. Like every time I like did blow was like, I had another first experience on Coke, you know? Mm. 
and so I'm doing pills and, and I'm doing blow and all this. And we go into the shed. It's me and a couple of the, the, the leaders of the guys and a couple of these girls. And that song, I feel like dying, playing in reverse. It's just blasting on the subwoofers. There's colorful lights on. And the girls are just having sex with all, all, all the guys in the shed. Mm. And it was like this moment. I was 13 and I was like, whoa, like, I don't know what's happening, but this feels like where I want to be. Right. Right. Well, let, let me ask you in retrospect now, you say you think that some of it could be wrong. You, you uh, maybe kids or just some someone who's younger than you that you want to be an influence to, you would steer them away from this or you would say, go ahead and experience this? I, I try to, I support everybody living their best life, whatever that means to them. Yeah. Right. So I have a lot of friends. Uh, but is there a point where they're too young to live their best life? Yeah, because I think they're really their judgment is very clouded, as mine was. You know, yeah. I was enthralled in this environment where I thought this was my best life, but what it really did was prevent me from living what could have been my better life. Got it. And you know, then I reflect and I have you know regret and remorse. I'm like, oh man, if I only graduated high school, if I only didn't you know get arrested that day, if I only didn't do drugs that mm. time, if I only didn't cheat on my girl, like look where my life maybe could have been. It would have been way greater than where it actually went. Brandy, you uh, when you, when you were talking about your story growing up, mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious: is your intention now for your child to like, or your children to not have that be their story growing up? One hundred percent. Okay, it, but let's say they make decisions that were similar to yours, but they're over the age of eighteen. Is this something that you want them at least to experience? You know, parting even not a little over bit over the age of eighteen, depending on what it is. I mean, like I and I say it a million times, like even expressing everything that's happened to me in my entire life if I even had the opportunity, I would not go back and change one thing because right. I'm so content and happy, not even content, just like excited and happy with where my life is now that had one of those things gone differently, I don't think I would be here. Mm. And so I think it's really important. Like everyone has their own path and like mistakes are part of it. So yeah. I wouldn't necessarily try to prevent them. I wouldn't encourage it either, but I, it's kind of like you said, like just... It is, it is a weird situation because my father was killed by a drunk driver, which caused me to have to grow up. If you ask me what I would like to have my father back, the answer is yes. Do I regret the situation? I mean, I had nothing to do with the situation. But I, to, I totally understand what you're saying because I wouldn't be here where I am right now. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but it is one of these situations where it's like I, I'm not specifically against anybody doing some crazy stuff when they're growing up as long as you're not hurting anybody else, right? But these are experiences that that – people should have my only question is like when i had uh who was i had jen rufon last week and she was talking about the first time she had sex she was 14 years old right mm -hmm. and i was like do you think in retrospect that that was like the best for you i'm not trying to be judgmental i'm just like from a physiological standpoint you know as far I as was, your... i was 15 i don't think that plays a part like you don't think it plays a part no no like i said like i i will try to steer my kids in the right direction as much as possible but i'll never interfere and i'll let them make their own mistakes got it okay yeah. Makes sense. Have you met Brandy's kid? No, I haven't. She got two kids, but her older kid, he's like super cool. Is he? Yeah, he's like a really cool kid. Very he, cool. He is the one I had, I told you, at a very young age, like single okay, mom yeah. type stuff. Yeah. Like, and he he went through everything with me. Yeah. At the time, I regretted it. Like, oh my God, I'm exposing him to this stuff. I'm whatever. But he is such, he's 10 years old and you'd think he was like 15. Like he's so solid. So developmentally, you think she, he's different because he had to go through he's all that? He's way more independent. He's way more self-sufficient. He's very aware. Like he's... He's, he's super advanced. Mm. There are pros and cons to all of it, but I mean, I I think overall he's an amazing kid because of it. I'm gonna I'm gonna sound super naive here, but you guys understand. I ask a lot of these questions because I've never tried anything. Yeah. Yeah, I've never tried. Like, I, it's something people still don't believe about. Me. I've never been drunk. You know what I'm saying? So when I come out and ask this stuff, it is absolutely not out of a place of judgment. I mean, look, I li <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I live in Las Vegas, so obviously I don't judge any of you for what you're doing, but it's just like I specifically don't know yeah. or, not, or never really felt the need to do it. But it's, so it's always been something that I'm very interested in. In, in your situation, so now you're growing up, you go through that. I, and I'm, I'm interested in, from a psychological standpoint, what you know, effect this had on you. You mentioned before you, you said you saw the older kids that you thought were cool. And then there was a feeling that went along with it when you said you're doing blow, you're 13 years old and you see all this kind of stuff happening around you. Um, did that develop, you said you didn't finish high school, develop, develop mentally. Do you think that that had an effect on you? Is this something? I think um, that I developed uh, quicker than the kids around me yes. because of this, to be honest. I had experienced things that only like very tough adults experience. Mm. And I experienced it as a child. I, uh, I was, uh, it's, the term's called being given your wings. And um, I was given my wings by a group of made men. And I was still a minor, I was a child. Uh, not a child, I mean, now I could say child, but 
I was still a minor, and these made men had, um, like, indoctrinated me. They had. We're talking about organized crime individuals who live in New Jersey, and then they're in inculcating you into their group. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So these uh, these men are 40, 50, and 60 years old. Some of them have, you know, done 15 years for, uh, you know, homicides, and some of them have been in RICO and racketeering and all of these things. And here I am, a minor, and they say, hey, kid, why don't you come on over because we want to hang out a little bit. And um, wh the way I had met them was, like, trusted. So when I <clears throat> was invited, similar experience I had at 13 by the 18-year-olds feeling accepted. I'm now 16 and 17 being accepted feeling this feeling of acceptance by like the next highest up I can get to, mm. you know, in that realm of perception. Do you, okay. Now, now you see a pattern. Do you still see that pattern today where you're, you're looking for that? I definitely see it in my own life. Do you see that pattern in your life even today where you're looking for that next group of the millionaires who now want to hang out with the deck of millionaires who then want to hang out with the billionaires? Do you understand what I'm saying? So I think what happened was as you were mentioning with the develop, develop, uh, developing, right? Yeah, I'm having trouble. We're having trouble with that word. It's developmental. That's what yeah, I'm trying to the say. The developmental stages yeah, yeah. was, <clears throat> I think it maybe it became ingrated in what I'm looking for in people's behaviors. Yeah. Right? So I think it became just a part of my chemical makeup, possibly. I have no conscious thought like, like, you know, who are you and who is he and which one of you should I become better friends with? Right. As a matter of fact, I it, this is like a non-topic in my life, not even in my brain. But I think what happens is, and I started considering this maybe in the last nine months. So you know they always say it's lonely at the top. Right? Yeah. The reason for that is because only one person could be the best. So it, Interesting. It's imp How can two people be the best? Right, you're right. That, that, that's true. But uh, we had uh, Justin Waller on here, and he talked about the, one of the problems he has is he goes back home to Louisiana, and the guy's like, I can't pay my rent. And he's like, yeah, I have a $100,000 payroll that I have to make. And he's like, the, we're having different problems, and the people I used to hang out with cannot stand in my fire. And because they cannot stand in my fire, I feel lonely. It's just right. like what you were saying. Yeah, right. So, so let's say that um, you're a, a, a top figure, let's say, right? Let's say you're like the number one NFL player. So if you're at the top, then how can you like stand in the fire of people that can't even play flag football? Yes. Right? So it just becomes this uh, form of isolation by proxy. So the only thing you can do is relate to other top figures. So where are you going to find – if you're top at NFL, there's no one else in the NFL you can hang out with. Mm. You can go find the top in the NBA. You can find the top in the MLB. You can find the top in acting, comedian. So it becomes this group of top people. And, of course, there's tears. Now, I'm not – an NFL, um, that's not me, right? Yeah. So wherever everybody in the whole human race falls on this scale, you get in basically where you fit in, right? Mm. It, it's relatable. You, you, you can share and help each other. It's really challenging for the guy who's concerned with his 100, 100K a month burn rate, right? Yeah. To talk about a guy who can't pay his $1,000 rent. It's really exactly. challenging to help each other yeah. in both. The, the guy who doesn't have a 1000 bucks for rent can't help the guy with 100K for the majority mm. of it. And vice versa. How can a guy, he's like, hey, man, I can't even take the time to have coffee with you because I don't know where I'm going to get another 90K to pay my payroll this month. Yeah, it's it's funny. I have a friend of mine who's very wealthy, and he's like, he and his friends buy each other like sports cars. And he's like, I, I have a hard time hanging out with people that are, are not as wealthy. And he's like, because they always want something, and the, and the, the interaction becomes transactional. So I can definitely see that. I would be interested if you, have you ever read any of Dr. David Buss's books or any books on evolutionary psychology? No. Uh, it, it's, it's really interesting. So the neurochemical, so serotonin is related <clears throat> to how people see each other as far as status is concerned. And they've, they've tested this in humans, but they've also tested it in like lobsters. You can find it. Lobsters that have higher serotonin levels, they're the ones that act more dominant amongst the other lobsters. And so the whole thing is like, where does this fit in evolution? There has to be a reason for us to have wanted to do this, right? You see people and you want, you consistently want higher, higher status. You consistently want more sexual selection. And so when you see that, that it's like a never ending race, have you found that? Have you found that as, as you continue to chase higher and higher and higher, you don't, you don't reach the end or you do not find happiness? Yeah. So it's uh, interesting you say that. Uh, and Brandy's watched this part happen. So for like the last like uh, 14 to 16 months, mm -hmm. my life had taken, you know, it was pretty public on social media, like a very like, um, um, like a celebrity-esque uh, social life. Yeah. Right. And uh, about three months ago, I made, so did Brandy. Actually, together, we both like, had this moment in both of our lives that ran parallel uh, where everything was changed. So in the, na in the last 90 plus days, my life has been completely different than it's been for a little bit over the past year. Mm -hmm. During that year or so, 
I saw that there was no end. There, I was losing the fulfillment of what in the beginning it was giving me. You know, like when a certain public figure would like DM me out of nowhere and I'm like, oh my God, I've been a hero of this. You know, this guy's been my hero like yeah. my whole life. And I'm like, what am I doing? Why is he sliding in my DM? Like, like what's, like he wants to be friends. It's cool. Um, I started to sort of lose that and it became almost like, um, like indistinctual, indistinct from um, the other conversations I was having. It was like, you don't get the dopamine, you don't get the dopamine yeah. hit anymore yeah. from the celebrity hitting you up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just about the celebrity. It's just certain people of interest in my life, Sure, you know? And, um, yeah, it started to wear off. And I said, this is irrelevant anyway. Yeah. And I cut all that off a little, a little over three months ago and I totally made it major adjustments. Do you, so I found that gratitude is the thing that helps me. Like I, I had the other day, I, I messaged Project Pat. He's my favorite living rapper. Yeah. And no intention whatsoever. He writes me back. He goes, yeah, I want to come on your podcast. I was like, shut the fuck up. You know, and for me, it's like, it, it's really not that big, like that a big of a surprise that he would come on. But at the same time, at, at, like, I feel like a little kid. I feel like a kid 20 years ago, like listening to fucking Three Six Mafia. I'm like, oh my God, dude, I'm going to get to, I'm going to actually be nervous talking to Project Pat. And it, it, that part, I, I think the only reason that I can maintain that is because I say before, like, I'm just so grateful from the fact that I don't live in the 18th. 50s. You know what I'm saying? I, yeah. I don't live in a time before antibiotics. I don't live in I don't live in the 17th century. I don't live in the Roman Empire. I actually live in 2022 where I have like high speed internet and I can watch House of the Dragon last night. You know what I'm saying? It's like that's the the world I live in. And I found that 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 helps. Is is that is that a realization you're having, or are you just completely cutting out all the desire and the want? Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly. I didn't think of it like that. Yeah. You know, I never I never considered that line of thought. I just knew that I wasn't feeling the way I wanted to feel from the stimulation that was around me. Yeah. And I said, if I'm wasting all my energy chasing stimulation that it's not being achieved, then what am I doing with this? When, we, when you say the stimulation, there are narcotics, there are women, there are there is gambling. Is there anything else? I mean, I suppose there's everything. There's everything. You, know, I was, you have a lot of tattoos too. Is that part of the stimulation as well? No, no. I stopped getting. I got like maybe two tattoos in the last four years. I've okay. been removing tattoos for three years. Really? I've been removing. My face used to be. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, yeah. but my face used to be like really heavily tattooed. Can, can I ask you like? So you understand most people don't have tattoos on their face. Like that is an area. Like what do you, when most people get tattoos? What is the thinking with the first time you get a tattoo on your face? Well, there's a couple of things. The first is my entire body from the top of my head to my toes is tattooed. Okay. So I basically was running out of space Got it. anyway. And also when I was young, I started getting tattooed really young. I, I think I had my face tattooed before SoundCloud was even created. Mm. So I was like ahead of that wave. And at the time people would, this, I think this was a low self-esteem problem I had. That's what I think. It, now I think that's what it is. I would feel like people were always testing me and pressing me. And I'm like, bro, like, I said, in my head, I was like, I've really been in prison. I've really, you know, I've really had these encounters. Who are you to talk to me the way you're talking to me? I used to think this to myself. Mm. The truth is, I'm just, I was just another guy. You know what I mean? I was like another person. If I stepped out of line, they were right to say a certain thing to me. But at the time, as like a young, immature person, I was like, what can I do to make them know, you know, that I am who I want to be or right. whatever? So I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to tattoo some of my gang affiliation on my face. Got it. Yeah. So now we talked about two different things here. You consistently wanting to hang out with a higher status group of people. Mm -hmm. And then you also wanting to prove to somebody, hey, why are you, say, someone says something disrespectful to you and you want to prove to them. Do you think these things have anything to do with each other? I think they all boil down to. Um, you, you said low self-esteem. That was the term yeah, you used. Low yeah. self-esteem, uh, uh, low self-worth, uh, low value. I think I had a lot of like internal um, doubt about myself. I thought that I felt inferior to everybody. I think I have an inferior complex. I think I had all these issues internally that I was not conscious of, nor knew how to work or cope with. So I think a, a lot of the behaviors I was exhibiting uh, was like, how can I prove to myself that I'm able to prove to them that I am who I think I am? Yeah, for sure. Brandy, I wanna ask you about this because you said before you talked about confusing uh, violence with love. Yeah. Right. And that seems like something you ha kind of have to work your way out of. And it also seems like it's a self-esteem thing. Is there, was there a point? Cause like, right, like from the outside looking in, like you're Brandy Andrews, like you're a big model, like everyone, you know what I'm saying? There's a, from, from outside looking in, it looks like there's a lot of validation for you. Was there a turning point for you where you're like, Hey, I'm worth this. I don't need to sit there and deal with people who treat me like shit. Um, was there a thing I mean, you, you saw? Say there's a lot of validation, but 
when you're getting validation from people who you don't value, it doesn't mean anything. Got it. So I could have a million people telling me like, for sure I'm beautiful, but like their opinions are irrelevant to me. Right. So, um, I don't, I mean, like I definitely struggled with like self-worth. I still do, but was it, was it your child? Because you, there's definitely been a transformation in your life, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned meditation. You mentioned Dr. Joe it was Dispenza. it was a lot of self work that got me to start like valuing myself more. But yeah, I guess like the violence with love and like like um, being treated like that my whole life growing up. I just I kind I thought I deserved it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I had to get to a point in my life where I was like realizing like I I don't deserve this, and I had to convince myself like I was worthy. You know what I mean? Of like something better. Uh, you guys ever listen to Wes Watson? You guys know Wes Watson? No. He's, he's awesome. This guy went to prison for ten years for uh, aggravated like uh, attempted murder. He comes out and he's like you, he's like. He's becomes a motivational speaker. He's a uh, Blackstone fitness. He's a bodybuilder. And he starts talking about, I don't try to make millions, become the man who's worthy of millions. Right. Yeah. And that's the, that's the whole thing. Like that whole belief was, was a huge my, change in mindset for me. It was that the, becoming this person and understanding that this is what you deserve. You deserve the success that you're getting. Right. And that's where it kind of plays into like what you guys were talking about too, though, with me and Mickey, like literally sat down and made like a list of the people that were in our lives and the value they were adding to our lives, or if they were a dead weight basically. And it, it sounds shitty. Like, and it kind of sounds shitty to us when we were sitting there, we're like, Oh, these as are an, as an entrepreneur. It sounds like the smartest fucking thing I've ever heard. It was yeah. a business move a hundred percent, but it, we also, so struggled like morally with like man these people have been our lives for you know 15 plus years these are good people to us like this is that but when we're around them when they're with us when things are happening when we're including them they're they're kind of pulling us down and we're trying to lift them up and it's just not working and at some point you have to cut the dead weight and so like that was where it I don't know it really messed with our heads a little bit but it was it was a business move and then it became more of like a we got to value ourselves it really it's funny it. from my standpoint it doesn't even seem the slightest bit offensive like it seems really? like an absolutely okay. normal thing to do yeah because i've had it i grew up with crack dealers in fucking east dallas during the crack epidemic in the in the late 80s early 90s so when i go back home i can't do the same shit i used i oh dude i was a first lieutenant going back to trap houses i was a first lieutenant just got back from iraq going to trap houses playing madden and i was like what the fuck am i doing like well, this is i'm about to ruin my fucking career because I want to hang out with my homies from high school. You know what I'm saying? Well, I have like, I have a lot of things I still need to work on, but yeah. one thing I don't is like loyalty. I was raised on loyalty. Loyalty is For like sure. my number one thing. So in my mind, it's like these people have been so loyal to me and, you know, never done me wrong. That's what made it hard for me was like, I almost didn't feel like that was enough of a reason. But then when I sat back and looked at my life, I was like, this is all the reason I need. Yeah. Has this has been the same uh, uh, realization for you? Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, Brandy's my best friend. You know, and by the way, her loyalty is is like bar none. Like yeah. she, like when when someone says ride or die, it's like legit. Like for sure. She's told you know. Yeah. Anyway, so um, uh, yeah. So a lot of the people in our lives are the same people, mm. and we really had to take a look. And it was like interesting, just like the dynamic. So I, when when certain of these people that we're referring to, entered my life, I knew I was in a place in the world that I have to be realistic. They will never get, they will never achieve certain levels that I had when we had first met each other. Mm. So every time now that, now that I'm a public figure or what have you, people are aware of things I have going on. So I have to be incredibly cautious. So these people had came to me kind of pre-social media, pre all that, and when we all encountered, I knew when I met them right away, in my head I said, you will never be able to achieve the things I've achieved. So are you coming because you want to take something from me or you wanted to share your equal value? You yeah, know? isn't that a weird thing that starts happening to you at some, I mean, for Randy, I'm sure it probably happened to you very much younger than it would for us because you've been pretty for a long time. I have not been, <laughs> I have not been successful for very long. I've and, never been pretty. Right. <laughs> the, the thing is like, it, it is, it's a weird thing now that like I have a seven figure business and people like want to come hang out and I don't know their intention anymore. Right. Oh yeah. You, I, I struggle with that hard. Yeah. I mean like, well, I mean for you, as far as you know, you make a lot of money on OnlyFans, but also as far as dating is concerned, you just don't know somebody's true intention. It m must be difficult sometimes. I just recently started struggling with that. Like mm -hmm. I would say right after my divorce, like the people I was dating after it was like, and it's, I know I used to never think of it cause I didn't think it was a big deal. But then the more people I started getting around and hearing them talk, I was like, Oh, that does matter. Like I never thought in a million years, like how many followers I had on Instagram would matter like in the dating world. And it does. And it it's does. so weird. It to is me. weird. Yeah. And so, um, I was having like a hard time grasping that, but then when I started like, you know, having a more clear mind and looking things in a more clear perspective, 
I kind of like, yeah, I got a little paranoid because it wasn't, it's not just the looks, it's the looks, it's the followers. It's the, now it's the money too, which is new to me also. And so, yeah, I get, I get really uh, insecure. It is interesting. I trust people to do what's best for them. And that's not always a bad thing, especially when you have a salesperson who's like a fucking murderer, who's like a killer at sales. Yeah. Cause and you're paying him really well. You want him to be out for himself. Mm -hmm. I like, I like setting up my life to where everyone's out for themselves. And in doing so we all help each other. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing with, with people with loyalty. I understand that at a certain point, I can't expect everyone to always look out for me. They are going to look out for themselves at some point. But when, when there's like a lack of loyalty for no fucking reason, that's when you start having a problem. When people just start snitching on you for no reason. That's out of jealousy was, that's where i was at exactly so so when these people came to my life like i was saying you know like i knew when we we had entered each other's lives i was like i know they'll never be able to provide to me what i have the capabilities of providing to them but are they doing their equal share so when some of them stopped doing their equal share or when their equal share still was not equivalent or they or whatever it may have been i was like then what am i doing the whatever it is i'm spending i'm not talking just monetary but whatever it is i'm spending whether it be my time my energy my resources my 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 you know whatever it may be my efforts or my money now like for example i used to do this thing and brandy would come every week i used to take anybody who wanted to come out to dinner out to dinner we're talking strange that's how we got to meet people yeah it'd be like our inner group and we everybody knew my thing once a week i take everybody out roughly 20k a week for the dinner bill so i'd spend about twenty thousand dollars on a dinner once a week and i did this every week and everybody knew that everybody was invited we'd like close down a restaurant i'd take the whole place and we'd ball out and i'd pick up the tab I wouldn't tell anybody this. My inner circle knew what was coming at the end of the dinner. So they'd send me the bill. I'd say, listen, everybody, I'm going to take care of the bill. I just would like for you guys to tip. And as soon as I said, I need you guys to tip, you would immediately see everybody start vetting themselves out. Some of the people would be trying to hide off in the bathroom. Mm. Some, of the, some of the people would be like, oh, I didn't bring a wallet. Right? So, oh, so you're, check, you're checking them out for that. Yeah. So this is how immediately, this is like a very, very basic thing that, that we used to do once a week. So we'd figure out right away who's willing to do their equal share. Now, huh. I'm not saying that everybody that was at that dinner can afford to pay a tip on a $20,000 sure. bill. For That's sure. not the point. The point is that if I drive a Lamborghini and you drive a Honda, right? And you say to me, hey, man, let's both leave at noon. You can drive faster. So this is roughly the distance we're going to meet. We're going to meet like a third from me and two thirds from you because we'll get there at the same time. That's fair. You know, we're putting the same effort. But if you call me and you go, hey, man, you should just drive all the way to me because you have a cooler car. Then you're not even doing your attempt to meet me in the middle. Right. You know? Not even trying to meet. Yeah. yeah it's I, effort I, and intention. I've done effort the, and intention. You, exactly. you know, I've done a similar thing where I actually go find the waitress, pay the bill and don't tell anybody. And then I tell the waitress, just walk up and be like, yeah, it's taken care of. Just say that to everybody. And then watch what happens. And I, then I look at people's reaction. If some people are just sitting there with no gratitude whatsoever, then I'm like, oh, okay, that's something that I'll notice. Some people are just like grateful for no fucking, like for me, every person that has had 1% to do with my success, I go like buy them a gift or be like, dude, I, I could not have done this without you. I had a, a co conversation with Dan Fleischman the other day. I don't know if you guys know who he is. That's but my boy. He, yeah. Dan, so, I'm going to be with him on Sunday yeah, for uh, a charity ball. Monday is his birthday party. Are you going to that? Today? No, next Monday. Oh, I don't know. Okay, yet. yeah. I don't know yet. So, so, uh, so Dan, you know, I call, I hit him up the other day. I was like, dude, I have so much to thank you for because I wouldn't have met Bradley if it wasn't for you. And I wouldn't have met Nick Cosman. I wouldn't have met uh, Cole Gordon. I wouldn't have met all these people. I wouldn't have read my, met Ryan Stuman. And all these people helped build my sales team and helped build, build my offer, which helped build my business. And I just like, dude, I just can't tell you thank you enough. And I appreciate when people do that. And I'm never like, no matter what happens, I just have to make it like, dude, I'm just, I get to fucking do a podcast every day. This is some shit I dreamed about in the shower, you know, 20 years ago when I was in the military and I get to do this every day. I'm never, ever going to like take this for granted. You know, every time I go up on stage at a nightclub or every time I get to interview a celebrity, I just try as hard as I can to never lose grasp of the fact that I get to do this as opposed to being a day laborer back in Texas. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one of the things that, uh, that I think is just really important is just, just trying to find that level of gratitude. Well, that's all that happened with us. I mean, we, we were really good about just surrounding ourselves with such good people and good things were happening to us. And then we got sloppy and we just kind of exactly. started allowing anyone and everyone around us. And we saw a difference in our what, what, own personal what, what, lives. What causes things to get sloppy? We it's, just stopped. We just, we got, I don't even know what the word I, is. I could be accountable for that one. I think it's a lot my fault. I think I was a driving force. Mm. I was so spread thin on certain like invisible chases 
that I never had time to do any like uh, self inventory check. So I was just spreading thin and I just couldn't care. And I just like couldn't put the energy in and the effort in to like be a sniper in the other parts of my life. Mm. I think I was being sloppy and being that we're so close when we go out, if I'm being sloppy, that means that she's also being sloppy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, for sure. That's, yeah. that, that's a really interesting thing. We were distracted. And then when, when we started to notice the difference in our, our financial and personal and everything else kind of life, we were like, whoa. Like, we Wait, gotta, so like, why, why does the sloppiness we, cause a difference in your financial life? What's going on there? It's just who you, like, it's so big on like, who you're surrounding yourself with. It mm. plays a part in your life and they rub off on you and things per, like, project onto you like, from them. And it's just like, like, we were very cautious about who we spent our time with, who we would like, allow around us. And we were doing really good and we were killing it with that. And when we got sloppy, it was, it was rubbing off on us. Like, you know, you're hanging out with like, not so great people, not so great stuff starts to happen to you. And we're just like, dude, we got a clean house. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about the mathematics that you yeah, just, sure. you've discussed before. I have a some, somewhat background in physics. Uh, what is, when you talk about, you've mentioned before with Baccarat, there are things that you understand as far as an edge, and I know that it's proprietary. You don't want to say what specifically those things are. And you understand there's a lot of people who just don't believe this. Mm -hmm. They don't think that there is an edge in Baccarat. Uh, can you explain, is it, is it fractals? Are you using like fucking, uh, like the golden ratio? Like what, what is, where is some of this, this, uh, and I'm asking from a mathematical standpoint because one of the things, so I study statistics, I use an options trader professionally. One of the things with the normal distribution, you have these fat tails and those fat tails don't make sense when you deal with equities, right? You have a 23 standard deviation move, the 2008 crash, crash but with cards that doesn't happen. With cards, there is only a finite number of outcomes that can happen. Like even in poker, right? You, there's only so many times, there's only a highest level hand and a lowest level hand and you can't go any lower than that. Does that make sense? Sure. So how, how, how are you able to beat the system in, in some of these games? I have to be a little bit cautious not to overshare mm -hmm. because of the proprietary natures. Let me just consider for a second. <clears throat> I'll tell you a story how it started. Okay. So I always was, um, I was always a, I was, as far as academics go, I was uh, an overachiever. Now, as far as behavior goes, I was the most underachiever you can be. I was like, like you know, I told you I was a super bad kid. So as far as like getting good grades and being in you know, like AP classes and things like this, was, I was in them and then immediately be expelled from school and so on, never graduated. So math was my strongest subject. And um, it was just it's something I enjoyed doing. Math is the same in every language. Yes. There's an answer, there's a solution. There's not like left for interpretation. Mm -hmm. One plus one equals two, and, and you can't tell me otherwise. So I always enjoyed math. Now, the story where this all really started was, I knew as a kid that I was a better gambler than all my friends. I just saw, like, I was just like winning more. You know, whether they didn't care, they didn't know, or like, whatever. I just, that was more focused, whatever it was. I always seem to have an edge on my friends, but that's not saying much. We were really young kids and like, no, none of, we weren't professional gamblers. We we're just being degenerates. So I got a little bit older. I knew that I always enjoyed the sense of winning. I love to win. I'm super competitive, right? So I kept gambling. I come from like a thick bloodline of gamblers. All my family's ga high stakes gamblers, all this. And it was just something always around. I said, well, this is a way I can easily prove if I'm in my competitive state, if I'm winning or not. It's like black and white. You either make money or lose money. So I kept on with the gambling and I always enjoyed it. So the story goes that I was, um, there's a guy, um, I don't want to say where he's from, but he's, you know, from like a Midwestern state, heavy accent, old gentleman. And we would play in Vegas. Neither of us lived in Vegas, but every weekend we'd find ourselves sitting together at the same table, playing Baccarat out in the same casino. And this casino was pretty empty. I think I'm the, not, not I think, I know for sure I'm the biggest player this casino has ever had in Vegas. It's in Vegas. I'm the biggest player they ever had. And this guy was... I think ranked like in the same like tier, mm. although, although he's substantially lower than me, but but still in that tier because it's not like a giant casino. So somewhere we, it's like a local water hole that he and I like to go. So every weekend we'd sit together and we play, and over like you know a year or something like this, we just became friendly. He gets the the same glass like it's eight hundred dollars a glass of whiskey, and he sips on it back to back, and he'll sit for twelve hours and just keep refill refill. He plays five hundred dollars a hand. He never wavers. He flat bets. Which game is this? Baccarat. Baccarat. Okay. He does not care if he wins or loses. He's like a so he's a hundred thousand dollar player, which means that on average he's he's estimated to be the value of a hundred thousand dollar loss, right? So when he mm. comes in, the casino says, "Oh, great, we're gonna make a hundred k." You know, this trip on this average, yeah. yeah. You know, that's where he's ranked, and he doesn't care. You know, um, he owns a logistics company, and uh, smart guy, old guy, right? And we're playing, and you know he's getting real drunk one day, and it's just me and him, been a long day, smoking a cigar. And he says, uh, he goes, you know, Mick, he goes, the game's really different now. I was like, what are you talking about? 
And he goes, um, he goes, you know, I've been playing Baccarat for 50 some odd years. And it used to not be like this. I said, what do you mean? How can the game change? It's the game. You know, you count to nine, basically. Yeah. And he goes, let me tell you. He goes, you see that? And he, I don't want to say what, but he points to something on the table. I say, yeah, he goes, he goes, you think we had that 50 years ago? He goes, that technology didn't even exist. It's okay, it makes sense. He goes, you see that over there? I said, yeah, he goes, that didn't exist 50 years ago. He goes, you see the way the dealer is handling this with the pit boss and the cards? I said, yeah, he goes, he goes, you think they knew that 50 years ago? He goes, 50 years ago, you could win in this game. You can't win anymore. Oh, wait, are you just, are you intimating that the casino is taking an edge and you're using their edge against them? That's exactly right. Okay, so the casino is taking liberties with the way Baccarat is played. And because they're taking, and if they're taking those liberties and you're aware of those liberties, you can take advantage of them also. Exactly. So the, the casino is now taking the distribution outside of the normal range and then you're using it. Wow, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Mathematically, that makes sense. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Crazy, okay. And so the story goes on, and again, I, can't, I think roughly I have to end the details of the story here, but he said to me, he goes, I'm going to prove to you right now that what I'm saying has validity. And I said, okay. And he goes, how many cards are in a deck? And I said, 52. He said, how many decks are in a Baccarat shoe? He said, eight. He goes, you know how many cards that is? I go, yeah. He goes, okay. He goes, what do you think the odds are that such and such pattern can repeat itself out of all those? Out of two cards, 416? What? At all those options. He goes, how, what are the odds that the same pattern will repeat itself twice? I said, I don't know, like one in a billion. So for a lot of my audience, we don't understand Baccarat. Okay, what, okay, okay. Yeah, so how many cards, like what, what are we talking about here? Okay, so uh, so let's do exact, so there's no mistake, ready? So we have 52 cards and in a deck. So it's 416, right? That'd be eight times well, 52? Eight times 52 is 416, uh -huh, right? exactly, yeah. yeah. So 416 cards, right? Yeah. So out of 416 cards, how many variations of cards can come out? How many cards total are we talking? 416. Are we talking two cards, three cards, four cards? How many? How many? Uh, you can call it out of two cards. To two cards. So it'd be yeah. it'd be 416 to the second power. Or no, it'd be... Uh, well, no, because you could have it's the same card. It's 416 and the 416th power. Because uh, all of the cards can run in okay. any order. All 416 can be in any order. Right, but you can have two... You can have two uh, ace twos. I'm sorry, uh, two of clubs, sure. right? But the, but you have eight two of clubs. Oh, well, correct. Right, so that those wouldn't count. Those if you have two of clubs, two 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 of clubs, and then you have a different two two of clubs, that's going to count as the same variation, even though they're actually different cards. Right, but we're not talking about two two of clubs out of fifty two cards. We're mm -hmm. about two two of clubs together out of four hundred and sixteen cards. Right. Although, yeah, of course, there's more than two two of clubs. Yeah. Yeah. There's eight of them. There's yeah. eight two of clubs. So mm -hmm. You know. So it becomes this really large number, right? And uh, so the short of it is, he says, what are the odds that it's going to happen? I said, and at the time, I didn't run the math at the time. This is like, we're just talking. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I, I can't do it right now. I will. I will. I am absolutely going to go home and do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please do. If you yeah. want, you can call me after. I, For sure. I, I have all of the math break. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But there's a, there's a, there's a lot of numbers in the computing of all this. Yeah. But if you, you can call me. So I, yeah, the, the hard part is they're not individual cards. It's not 416 different cards, even though they are actually different cards. They're not different cards. Right. Well, right. Yeah. Right. It's the same repeating exactly. 52 cards eight times. You're right. Yeah. So he goes, at the time, there was I didn't have any real math to it. I've yeah. never done the math, right? I was yeah. just like, I don't know, like one in a billion, right? He goes, right, let me show you something. So, okay. So me and him both, I, I matched him. He does, again, he always bets a purple chip, $500. Flat bets, doesn't care. Win, lose, doesn't matter. No. Yeah. So me and him bet, and he goes, watch. And we played the whole shoe. Neither one of us considered first, second, or winning or we losing. Not important. What was important was I was so just enthralled and engulfed in this this exploitive theory that he's showing me live in front of my face. And I was like, this is impossible. Uh, not impossible. This is improbable. And he goes, improbable. It's, it's, what do you mean? It's right in front of you. It's literally in front of your yeah. face, tangible. I said, doesn't make sense. And he goes, okay, let's keep going. We keep going. We keep going. And he goes, watch this. Watch that. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. And I bet that that will equal what's about to happen. So let's find out. Next cards come out. It equaled what he said. And it was like this incredible hit rate, like his, his, his conversion of accuracy was, was astronomical. I said, I, I said, how did I, how did, how did nobody, how come this is not talked about? And he goes, what do you want to say about it? He goes, you're either going to, either you notice it and you want to play or you notice it, you don't want to play. That's it. You're welcome to go home or you're welcome to walk in. The casinos are open 24 hours, 24 hours. And I thought about this and I thought, and I thought, I said, well, I said, I'm gambling such huge money. I should figure this out. What is happening? Yeah. And I said, let me go to another casino. Let me go a different day. Let me try two different tables. Let me try this. Let me try a different city. Let me try that. And 
what he was discussing in the change of technologies over the last 15 years of the game of him playing, I noticed the same technologies were changed in all the casinos. It was consistent. I said, okay. I said, there's something going on here that I'm not supposed to know. So, so the, the casinos maybe hire some MIT consultant who gives them some legal way of giving themselves a half point more edge. Yeah. And that, which takes it out of the normal distribution. But if mm-hmm. you know that's happening, then you can take advantage of it. Theoretically, that's what you're explaining. Theoretically, yeah. I can see that being a possible, yeah. maybe not probable, but possible opportunity. Okay. That's pre- okay. I get it. That makes sense. Mathematically, that I, I do understand what you're saying. You also talk about feelings have no regard to math. Yeah. So you also talk about you have a, a hard time wanting to coach some other people because if they go on tilt and they start getting angry or wanting to come back at you, uh, then they can screw up the system that you teach them, right? And this is just mathematics, right? right. Is, this, is this a difficulty that you find with yourself and with other people? Yeah, so the initial thought I had with this, excuse me, was that I play with a lot of Asian people, and Asian people I find, for whatever reason, to be the most superstitious. So when I'm playing, particularly with Asian women, they say, I know that I'm supposed to believe that the answer to the next hand is X, Mm. but I feel like it's going to be Y, so I'm going to bet Y. And these are losing gamblers. I said, what do you mean you have a feeling? You know, this is like when sometimes somebody stays on 12 and sometimes hits on 12. I'm like, you have a feeling? What do you feel? feeling stupidity you know and, and i said this doesn't make sense I said, what are you? I said, the math is the math if the dealer shows a 10 and you have a 12 you're a likely loser you have to hit i don't care how if you feel happy sad and different it, it hit the math is the math the math is the math is the math and that's where it really really started then i realized that 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 same sort of motto applies it's so applicable in so many forms of gambling so a lot of people get really nervous so i have a history of going on incredible runs I turned like 200 bucks into 800,000. I turned uh, 80,000 into 6.2 million. You know, and I've done these kind of, I've turned $500 into over 50,000. Like once I did three times in one day once with, with, with groups of people, you know. And, and um, you know, I, uh, so I had this history of going incredible runs. And people are like, how do you do it? And I'm like, well, I don't break my chips down at the end. You know, so a common thing that a non gambler might not know is that a lot of gamblers, the, we do units. So let's let's pretend you buy in for a thousand bucks and you decide your your betting unit is going to be one tenth, which means a thousand, right? So you buy in for ten k and each unit's one k. So when it's time to press, you said, okay, I'm going to go from one unit to two units. That means you went from one k your base to two k is your bet, etc. Well, if you start losing, a lot of gamblers will decrease their unit size. And so what you have to consider that in the long haul, you have to win that many more hands because you have to now build back up to your initial unit base and then play from your unit base to become profitable. Where if you stick at the unit and you don't get scared, they go, well, yeah, but I feel like I'm going to lose. I'm scared. I'm nervous. I, uh, you know, I did it. You're talking about like a Martingale strategy. Not, no, I think Martingale's a losing strategy. I have yeah. a whole story about Martingale. Well, that's what, but that's what it sounds like you're describing. They bet less as they, as they start losing more. You yeah. Know yeah. So, well, yeah. So the, the basics of the Martingale is um, that if every time, well, actually every time you lose, you, you increase your bet. So, okay. so if you bet one unit and you lose and your second hand, you bet two units. Because if you win, you break even with the bet. Okay. I'm, I'm confused. You're correct. Yeah, okay. Right? Got no, it. it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. You know, and then if you lose your two unit bet, then you bet four units. You lose mm. your four unit bet, you use eight units. But at the end of it, you know, you're jeopardizing not just 10 units on that hand to win one unit, but you're already in for 20 uh, some odd units by then. Yeah. Right. So there's no, I played this one time, by the way. I have my coach said to me, who's also my best friend, total degenerate. He goes, Hey, man, I've been Martin Galen for like two weeks and it's been working. I said, I think you're getting lucky. I said, That's what I think. So at the time, I was allowed to bet 150000 per hand. I said, let's martingale. I have 150K cap. It's going to be impossible for this not to work. So let's sit down with a pen and pad and let's gamble and let's figure out how good the martingale works. So I started with a $1,000 unit. With my $1,000 unit, you could run the math on it. I played and I lost every hand until I hit the 150K mark and I still lost. And even if I had won, that means I'm risking $150,000 to win $1,000. There's no sound businessman in the world that's going to tell you that's a smart investment. So I found that it didn't work, and I still had to start playing 150k a hand just to win my money back with some profit. So I found provenly the Martingale system doesn't work. And if it did work, I think everyone would just do it. Mm-hmm. You know? 
<clears throat> but uh, and it's also really hard for people to get 150k cap. Most people are capped it. I don't know. Can, can we just back up when he, when you say unit? Unit has to do with like a percentage based on how big your the, your total amount of money is. So a lot of times, if you have a million dollars, your one unit is going to be bigger than if you have ten thousand. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So a lot of people probably don't understand that because they're used to like times of currency. Also, Martingale is a strategy that came up in the 18th century in France for gamblers, and the guy's name was Bill Buckley, the CIA agent that I was trying to say before earlier. Sorry, I just mm -hmm. want to clarify that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I proved that the Martingale doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and if it did work, everyone would do it. And everybody has way lower table limits than 150K anyway. And, and I spent a thousand, my unit was a thousand, thousand dollars, and I still hit 150 and lost. But anyway, so. Um, well, I think the Martingale doesn't work because your expected payout when you're a gambler is below zero. What do you mean? It's like negative EV? Yeah. Yeah, I don't the expected know, value is below zero. Like uh, the, uh, Martingale would work, I think, if you have an expected value. If you're doing something else like selling stock options or selling mm -hmm. insurance, I think Martingale probably would work. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. Uh, to be honest with you, I really wrote off Martingale really quickly. <laughs> yeah. For that many people to talk about it, know about it, not do it, and the casino like not put any preventions in, it seems like the most logical thing. Like, don't even waste your time running of the math. Of course. Like, yeah. How could it be legit? You know. Yeah. So that was like, one of the first things I wrote off, but. Um, but I'm sure it is negative. Like, I mean, I proved it was in my one experience. Well, in general, any gambling sh should have a negative EV or the, the casino wouldn't put it out there. Well, that's exactly yeah. right. right. So that's exactly right. Even, so, even poker, they're going to take... A lot of people don't understand they're taking, uh, they're taking a, a VIG. Yeah, yeah they're taking the, a rake. The VIG is the other yeah, rake, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so a lot of people ask me all the time about bonus bets and side bets and this and that. And I says, listen, listen, listen. I says, if that was in the player's interest, why would the casino offer it? Why would they put it in there? They don't have to put it in there. They go do like in LA, everybody plays Dragon and Panda. Um, in Vegas, they play uh, pair, pair, tie, right? So the pair pays 11 to 1. They say, oh, I like to play the pair. I said, That's fine. If it hits, it's great, but you know, you're not likely to hit it more than 13, you know, one out of 13 hands. They said, How do you figure? I said, I don't even have to run the math on it. If it pays 11 to 1, you're lucky if it hits 13 out of 1. Yeah, it's got simple. It. I mean, it's so simple. You don't have to actually run the math, it's like self explanatory. So you can just run, if you want to bet those side bets, you have to consider yourself, whatever it pays out, have I lost? Have I spent more than that trying to get there? Yeah. Then you're losing, you're at negative EV. It makes perfect sense. If you're playing a an, uh, something that has a payout of nine to one and you hit it within every seven hands and you're profitable, run it, go ahead. But if, it's, if it pays nine to one and you hit it 11 or 12 out of one, then you're always running negative. Just stop playing it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, you, 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 I'm asking from a PL standpoint, what is going on with the casinos to where you're saying that they banned you because you were winning so much at Baccarat? Is this something where you're winning at, because I've had uh, Vegas Dave was on here and he talked about the casino heads talking to each other, because he's, but his whole thing is about sports betting and futures. Uh, with your situation, you also mentioned the same thing that the, the heads of these casinos are all talking to each other about gamblers who might be breaking the system in some way or another. What what is from their experience? You're winning a bunch here. You're winning a bunch here. You're winning a bunch here. Like, what are they experiencing? What are you doing that caused them to finally say, "We don't want you here anymore"? I mean, I, I understand you're winning, but like more specifically, is this over a period of six months, a year? Is this something that you're doing at several different tables at the same time? Like, what's going on here? Um, so I've gone through like every type of phase of gambling. Mm -hmm. So what's relevant for the the banning me from casinos? took place over the last four years. Mm -hmm. So I've been a net profit winner four years consecutive. Before that, it was like a hit or miss. I was a little bit more of just like a gambler, but mm. I was also like doing business and not really, I wasn't like a full-time gambler. Mm. It's only been the last four years. And the last four years that I've been full-time, I've been net profit every year in, in all casinos. So what happened in the beginning was it wasn't enough money for it to be relevant. They would put me like in what would be considered like the high end of like this, this second place tier, you know, like, mm -hmm. a, like a low six figure player. Right. And they're like, Oh, he's winning. Good for him. We want him to win now. Cause one day he's going to freaking really pump it, you know? But as I started pumping, I kept winning. I kept, and I bump up to the next tier. I'm in the top tier. Then I'm working my way up the top tier and I kept winning. And they said, well, we're going to, we're going to put certain forms of manipulation in his way. Call it, call it, um, we're going to, we're gonna make it harder for them. You mentioned like actual physical distractions that they would yep. do to you, like security guards bumping into your chair, yep. uh, all of a sudden stuff is missing from your room, yep. things like that. Yeah, so then they start pulling some of those plays. You know, they said, we're gonna, <clears throat> we're gonna, um, you know, screw with his psychology. So we're going, to, we're going to affect his room service orders. We're going to affect um, his uh, ability to go to a show. We're gonna tell him things are sold out. 
I said, how? They used to tell me the rooms are sold. The entire hotel is sold out. I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? I'm the biggest player you've had all year, and you gave my room to somebody else. You have a special block of rooms for guys like me, specifically for this. Nah, sorry, sold out. We got an event this weekend. I said, what event? They go, oh, it's a, a you know, cowboy boot show. And I'm like, how many people are coming in to buy cowboy boots that you can't give me a room? Like, sorry, no room here. If you want to swing by and pass, you know, pass by and play, you can, but you can't stay. And they start putting these things in. You know, so they used to, um, they're, they're, I have like this huge list, uh, breaking into my room, uh, flipping over cushions, telling me that I'm selling drugs. So one time they accused me of selling drugs and they brought all these security in. They made me and uh, I was with three other guys. They made us all like stand up against the wall and they like flip the cushions. They look for all these drugs. I'm like, I'm like, the four of us are sober guys, by the way, all four of us. Yeah. I'm like, what are you, it's just four men in a room. Like, like, what are you talking about? You know, they do all these things. One time they, um, you know, I, I had like a story that went pretty viral where I had $7 million on the table mm -hmm. and three securities surrounded me and they, they, um, they pushed me up against the table and I couldn't get up and I couldn't reach my money and it became this whole scene. And you know, they do like, I mean, the list goes on. I could probably go on for like hours about all these stories. They'll tell room service, don't deliver my food, but don't tell me that they're not supposed to deliver it. So all these time, all this time goes by. I believe what they're doing is thinking I'm going to get so bored and fed up, but still be hungry. And if you're hungry, you're not thinking clearly that eventually I get bored, go downstairs to gamble, but I'm gambling hungry, not thinking clearly and lose the money back. And they do like all these tactics and the, sto the stories go on and on. And, but yeah, they start doing all these things. Was this something, have you talked to other gamblers that, that they've done this to them also, or is this just something you think is unique to you? Um, no, I have some friends uh, that similar things have happened to. To be honest, a lot of my super high-stake gambling friends, a lot of them are losing players, to be honest. You know, mm. they, they're aware of it. You know, it's not a secret. So they have the opposite treatment. You know, they're, they're what the <laughs> casino loves. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, that's it. You know, they harass me, all types of stuff. Um, you also mentioned before, this is something that's outside of my reality. I don't understand. You would have to call the casino and they would have to give you regulations mm -hmm. on, you have to negotiate with the casino in order to step inside. This is because you were winning a lot? So the first part is no, everybody has the right to do that. Even you, even Brandy, everybody, okay. everybody has the right to do that. Okay. You get a casino host, you call your host, you say, Hey, I'm coming in. These are some terms I would like. And depending on what your status in the casino is, they'll either laugh you off or they'll be like, all right, buddy, I'll give you a free yeah, buffet. I've, so. I've seen a guy, he, was, he had uh, like, he, they, he had 100,000 in comps or something to that effect. I've seen two, this happened twice. One guy had 100,000 in comps and they set up a poker table in his, or a blackjack table in his room. And he got to make up the rules for like some of the blackjack and they were like, fine, whatever. This guy had lost so much money. Yeah. The second thing guy I saw, um, and I'll tell you because he's a buddy of mine, he had so many gambling comps that they actually, he's like, what do you what do you want us to do with this? He goes, throw me a pageant. They actually threw him the Las Vegas International Model Search. For those of you guys who remember when that happened, that was because a guy had so many comps at MGM, he's just like, yeah, fly all these girls in. They flew 50 girls in to do a fucking beauty pageant for him. And my friend, Alyssa Sawaya was the host. It was wild. You're right. These casinos, if you lose for these casinos, they will bend over backwards and do some really crazy stuff in order to keep you coming back. Yeah, for sure. So what they do is a lot of them will contract out to a guy that can do things that aren't technically legal yes. or within regulation, and that's your new point of contact. And I have a lot of those guys. I got to be honest, I for the most part, I hate casino hosts. They're like the slimiest, scummiest, you know, uh, tuxedo-wearing scumbags, you know, worse than Wall Street guys. Um, you know, they're liars and they're cheaters and they're, they're hurtful and um, they get paid when you go broke, you know? So, but a lot of those third party guys are my friends outside of the casino because some of them are like pretty cool people. Yeah. Some of them, not a, not most. You you had that party at the uh, mansion at MGM? Yeah, I, I used to party there a lot. Yeah. Okay. I went, I was at one of them. At one, one of my parties? Yeah, I met you there and I, it was, we met just for a second. Uh, and I remember this because I saw the video that you did. And it was like, that video was like the day before I got there. I remember. Uh, I'll tell you this, the background. Uh, Wait, which party did you come to? Um, it was during COVID. Uh, I was there. It was nighttime. My friend uh, Morgan was there. Uh, and I would, I'd, I would have to go back and remember all the people that were there. But I, I definitely remember meeting you. You, I walk in. You were in this far room over to the right, and um, I met you. And I walked all around. There was a pool, like a little pool area in the back or whatever. And I checked out the whole place. Was it fun? Yeah, it was pretty fun. I knew, I knew half the people there, so it was, it was a pretty cool deal. Oh, I was, I was the only person there. I think in the whole place that didn't have tattoos. I, think. <laughs> I remember feeling a little out of place. But yeah, um, yeah, the, with those, with those uh, parties. So this is my question. You have a cantankerous relationship with the casinos and you're still doing this. Are you, and then you also mentioned that they, they tried to kick you out after that. Mm. 
is this a situation where you're just trying to do it in their face? You're just trying to have fun? Like, what's going on? Is this just for content? What's going on here nah, with that? No, I never did anything for content. I don't make money on social media. Right. Yeah, I never did anything just for content. Um, I don't know. I just like to party, man. Yeah. I like to party. Yeah. And you just like the, the mansions at uh, MGM? It's a sweet setup. It is, it is a sweet setup. That's where, that's where uh, they put Michael Jordan. That's where they put Tiger Woods. If you guys watch the Tiger Woods documentary, mm -hmm. where they're talking about he goes to a special place with a special entrance. That's the mansions at MGM. And then all of a sudden, a certain guy walks up to you and offers you things that a casino host is not supposed to be yeah, able to yeah, offer you. Yeah. Those things actually do happen. Yeah. You know, I lived for a while in Lady Gaga's mansion. Okay. Her MGM mansion. She has a specific one. And you know, there's uh, baby grand pianos in all of them. Yes. So she has a request to take their piano out and bring hers in. And uh, for like a decent amount of time, I lived in, in her mansion there. Wow. Yeah. Okay. How much does that run a night? Those, uh... I've never paid. I don't know. Okay. So they're just giving you, these are like part of the comps? Yeah. That's pretty amazing. I think it's uh, kind of like an invite only portion of the building. Got it. Um, so this is another thing I thought was really interesting. So I have a lot of fitness guys that come on sometimes and one of the things they do for them is called natty or not, where they actually go over whether or not these guys are on steroids. And, um, and I've I seen that. Yeah, I see that. And I really enjoy that because one of the, my favorite guys to do that was uh, Gregor Gallagher's friend of mine. Uh, he went on, he did a natty or not thing with, uh, Derek more plates, more dates. They ran his panel blood work. And I was like, dude, that's awesome that you did that. There's another, another guy like the, the they, they'll face it head on. Mm -hmm. You did the same thing with Spencer Cornelia, except this was different. This had to do with, um, your gambling, yeah. right? And I thought it was really impressive because he makes a he makes a video where he calls into question a lot of your claims, and instead of getting angry about it or posting horrible things on it, you reach out to him, uh, and then you uh, what I felt like is a really was probably the best way to handle it. And what, the way I would like to handle it when people have questions for me is you're like, hey man, come on by, and I will answer any one of these questions. Can you go over your thinking there? Yeah, hundred percent. So I. I'm now friends with Spencer, and I yeah. like Spencer, a really cool kid. Yeah, and, he, sta he ends up staking you. He believes you to the point where he ends up staking you. Oh, yeah, you yeah, he buys poker. me in the World Series. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I'm so new to social media, and particularly I definitely didn't know who Spencer was at the time. Mm -hmm. I remember I was, like, actually in the jacuzzi inside my hotel room, and uh, it was, like, super early in the morning. My buddy from Miami sends me a link, and I open the link, and it's a video about me, and I'm like, who has interest in me? You know, and I, um, and it's Spencer, and I'm watching, and I'm like, oh, this fool, man. He's like, I'm like, bro, this is, I was like, the stories that he's telling aren't even full stories. You know, he's taking things out of context. He's misinterpreting the sentence. He's mm. hearing it, not for the for the factual statement that was said, but for the way his brain was interpreting it. Yeah, and he's missing a lot of key parts. I said, you know, I I I gotta give it to this kid though. He he did educate himself the best that he could based on the information available to him. Yeah, he was non biased. He was non biased. He was impartial. Yeah. He was neutral. He was honest. And he wasn't attacking. He wasn't like, uh, Mickey's a liar and a fraud and a scumbag and he's cheating and he's stealing your... It wasn't like that. He, he actually said, he goes, I really don't know. But he goes, based on the information I have, I don't think it's legit. I said, you know what? Let me give this kid a chance. And, you know, I, I knew... I sent one text message out and probably within 30 seconds, I was in a group thread with Spencer. I said, hey, Spencer, it's Mickey. No hostility. I saw your video, and oh, I need to give you a lot of credit. I think you did a wonderful job based on the information you have, but you're lacking a lot. Would you mind if I gave you a fuller picture, and after you have the you know full full disclosure and full access, you make another video, and this way you don't have to guess or assume anything. You can confirm that I am illegitimate. And but if you happen to have of opinion to the contrary, I would prefer that you stated so. I just want you to tell the truth, but say it with conviction at the end of your next video. He goes, I'll take you up on that offer. I said, come on over, man. And we uh, coordinated, and he did come, and he sat down with me. And uh, I actually watched his video again that night, and I, on index cards, I took a note of everything that was in question. Yes. And I handed it to him. I said, hey, just so you know, this is every single piece of information from your video that you have in question or in doubt about me. And I think you should ask me again and give me the opportunity to show you with validation, you know, whether, you know, it's accurate or inaccurate. And we did that. And he didn't find a single flaw. As a matter of fact, nobody has found a single flaw. It's never happened. I've never made a claim that wasn't confirmed. I'm quite public now. And I'm easy to find, and I can't hide. Yet nobody has came forward and said anything wasn't true. Never once has there been a disproven claim I've made. As a matter of fact, it's only been the opposite. 
I've only, after more people do some due diligence on me, I've only provided more receipts. I have never left anything in question. If I said it, I meant it. And when somebody asks me for the proof, the first thing is you can all suck my dick. Your opinion of me doesn't affect my bank account. But some of you I like. And some of you deserve some answers. If you want to build a relationship with me and you have to question my integrity, my accountability, and my honesty, I think it's an injustice for me not to give you some answers. So there are people in my life who I give these answers to. Everybody has came forward and said it's all legitimate and they've seen the receipts. I've shown the receipts. Almost every receipt of every claim I've ever made is public information. You can look it up. The only time you find disbelievers and disprovers are guys that are making assumptions, taking things out of context, or not reading full stories. A lot of them are completely empty pieces of information that people are sharing. Well, I think, I think the people are empty. Like, I, I think it's the difference between Spencer Cornelia and like Phylon, right? You know, I don't know if you know who he is. He, this guy just makes hit pieces on people, mm -hmm. and he does so because he's coming from a small place, right? Whereas I love, I, I don't know if you've ever seen Derek More Plates, More Dates. He's the one who does the natty or not, and he's never like hypercritical of the guy. He's like, hey, this guy looks fuck. You like, you look fuck. Like Michael Hearn is a, a dude who, who tells everybody that he's, he's a former Mr. Universe. He tells people he's never taken steroids. I'm sorry, Michael Harden is obviously taking steroids. There's no question whatsoever. But the thing, like the guy is, he's got veins on his neck the size of fucking garden hoses. He's mm -hmm. clearly on roids. But like the, the problem is, he's not critical. He's like, dude, you look fantastic. Just admit that you're doing this. And that, like you said before, when I watched Spencer, he was trying to not be biased. That is to me how you would want to build a YouTube channel if you're going to be skeptical. Mm -hmm. Let's just stick to the facts and not start attacking people yeah. based on things like, because you understand a lot of people aren't attacking you based on facts. They're attacking you because they don't like the fact that you are making money and sleeping with girls that they want to sleep with. Well, that's exactly right. You know, and bro, I've had people take shots at me for the way I look. Yeah. And I'm like, bro, I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I've seen some hit pieces on me and they start off by screaming about the way I look. And I'm like, you immediately, I said, buddy, but like in my head, I'm like, I wish I could reach out to this guy and be like, let me like give you some real ammo to make a good hit piece because you're missing the mark. As soon as you start attacking things like that, you completely lost credibility for the rest of your video. Mm -hmm. If you really want to try to like hate me and, and put, you know, hit, hit piece on me, whatever, come correct, come factual. The problem is it's never happened. There's, there's nothing, there's no factual dis disproving happening. And I give everybody the chance. I mean, it's not like a secret, like. My claims are my claims. Not a single, the casinos hate me. This is like, a, this is, everybody knows this, right? I, I constantly post videos of security throwing me out, executive, I told executives to suck my dick, and I did it nonstop, right? I got, I, oh my God, I've banged so many executive, casino executives' daughters. I have so many videos of them in my phone. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Look at Brandy's face. <laughs> We're going to get to that in just a second. Keep going. I'll, I'll show you some videos. I got a video no, no, fresh I don't in know, my phone. I don't know if you should be showing me your videos. I got a freshie in my phone. <laughs> I'm going to fuck around and go to jail right with you. I got a freshie in my phone of a very high up at MGM. His daughter came to my Halloween party with all her UNLV friends, and they all got in a line on my balcony at the jacuzzi and just got naked and just said, happy Halloween and all this. This, the girl ends up staying butt naked for the entire night. Mm. I got the vid like, bro, like. Oh no. Anyway, so so <laughs> you would think that her dad, who clearly hates my guts, mm -hmm. would come forward and leak some bad, you know, leak some press on yeah. me, leak my win loss. Stand up, make a statement. You're you're MGM. Just make a statement. Say what I'm saying about you is not true. I'd say I say a lot of bad things about. Oh, the casinos. Why don't they ever step forward? Never once has a host, uh, a restaurant waiter, a dealer, a pit boss, an executive, a floor, a cashier. Never once has anybody been able to step forward. It's never happened. Nobody's ever came forward and said it's not true. So I'm going to play devil's advocate. A couple yeah, things. Uh, first off, a lot of people would say, well, you're not banned for Baccarat. You're banned because you were maybe rude to a pit boss or something to that effect. Uh -huh. And the second part would be um, the thing about the casinos is like, I don't know if you guys have noticed it. So a lot of people don't realize this. This is the suicide capital of, of the United States. Vegas is. Nobody talks about this. Yeah. You want to know why? Because when somebody dies in a casino, you know what happens? They get taken out on a stretcher yeah, and they yeah. get pronounced dead on the street. They get pronounced dead on Koval or they get pronounced dead on Paradise. Yeah. They do not get pronounced dead on Las Vegas Boulevard. It's bad for business. It's bad for business. I had a friend of mine. He is very worried about tax evasion. He knows not uh, I'll give you a hint. He's the most hated man on the internet right now. He, uh, he is afraid of coming uh, to the U.S. because he's afraid that the U.S. government is going to come after him. And I'm like, it, it might happen in Los Angeles, but it's not going to happen here because it's bad for business. It, nobody's going to get arrested here out in a casino that just doesn't happen here right we play by different rules here but yeah you're right when you when you talk about that uh, happening before that uh, playing devil's advocate that's what probably a lot of people would think the reason why you're banned is because of this and not because of this 
Do you have any? Do you have any paperwork or anything like that? Because you said you're one of four people in history that's banned because of Baccarat. Yeah. You have any kind of back and forth with a casino host or anything like that? Oh my god, bro! You pick a casino. I'll pull up some text threads right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you just pick one. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, I'll no, do it live on the air. I don't. Yeah, I don't no, no, we don't have to do it right now. You yeah. should probably. I mean, if you post that, I mean, that'd be something interesting. I to did. See. I, no, I post on he my does. story all the time. All yeah. the time. Yeah. 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 Okay. Bro, I put. Bro, I put. We them got on cameras blast. on him when we pull up to valet because yeah. it's just like we know. Oh, yeah. I, I put them on blast. I'm constantly screenshotting uh, text threads and group threads and emails and posting them on my Instagram story. Got I it. put all my juice in my stories, by the way. So if you follow my page, keep an eye on my stories. That's where the good stuff is. Got oh, it. I put them on blast. Bro, I shut down two casinos Instagram pages f through my stories. Okay. Oh, my God. I forgot about this. It happened not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The last one. So the first one I did it to was Park MGM. Mm. This, so Park MGM, I caught them cheating. Right, I caught them cheating. I was with some professional poker this is, this players. Baccarat or poker. in Baccarat, in Baccarat. Okay. I caught Baccarat. them cheating. And by the way, I post videos catching casinos cheating all the time. All you gotta do is look on my page, my TikTok, and my Instagram. Right, it's at Dirty Goth Boy and Boy is B O I. He immediately yeah. gets a text message about it, like oh from them trying to be like, "Oh, what do we need to do? Like, take this down." Like, oh yeah, because every time I post, exactly what Brandy said, exactly right. The casino texts me every single time. They all know that there's like usually one person in every casino that I'm friendly with, for the most part. They can all piss off and suck my dick, right? But there's usually somebody that I'm willing to communicate with and we're friendly and stuff like this. But every single time I make one of those posts, they have that person immediately reach out to me and I screenshot it and I put it out there. Bro, every time they want to keep a private conversation with me, every time, I'm like, what are you keeping this private for? Let the people know. Yeah. I was like, what, what are you trying to do here? Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't need this to be private. Go ahead, make it public. So I recently went into a casino downtown. I do this thing with my friends. We'll go in, whatever money's in our pockets, whether it's $20, $1,000, $200, doesn't matter. We just go in, we're like, let's see who can run it up the most. Pure entertainment, right? So we'll go find the biggest dirt hole in Vegas. We'll just pull up in there and just, just fun, goofing off, right? And so we go into this one spot that was downtown. We never been. We're playing for like 10 minutes. There's like five of us. And the pit boss is like a big fan of mine. And we're just like goofing off, you know, and having a good time. And he picks up his cell phone. I see it. I nudge my buddy and I go, this is the call. He's looking at me. He hangs up the phone and he goes, Mick, I'm not sure what you did exactly, but I was asked to tell you you need to leave. And I turn around, there's security all behind me already. And I'm like, I was like, security. I said to the security, I said, you guys ain't got to do all this. I said, I'm going to leave. Like, what do you want me to do? Fight you? We're playing $5 a hand. You know what I mean? Yeah. I said, don't worry, guys. So we left. And we didn't film any of it and it doesn't matter, but I, I DM'd. Uh, first, I made a post. And I tagged the casino. I think I filmed on the way out being thrown out. And I tagged the casino. And I said, why did you throw me out tonight? And I saw that they watched my story. So I saw it. I screenshotted that their username watched that story. And I posted that and tagged them again. Then they DM'd me, right? And they go, hey, can you tell us more about your issue? I'm like, what? I'm like, no, you guys threw me out. Just tell me why you threw me out, right? And they go, why don't you email me here? I said, no need to email. I'm going to screenshot everything you send me. Let us all know. Tell the people, why'd you throw me out? So for the whole like 24 hours, I'm posting every single part of the transcript of me in this casino. They ended up shutting their Instagram down. Mm. The whole casino shut their page was down. Was that the one that we had like the group thread of people and we were all commenting on it? Everybody was commenting. Anybody, we, we have like a strong, you know, group of social network. Yeah, is this somewhere on Fremont? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah, so I, we all went on there and started I can picture it all in my head, yeah. Yeah, it got a big reach. That's interesting. Yeah, they shut their Instagram down and that's like a second casino. And the first casino was the Park MGM that this happened to. I caught them cheating and I put it on blast and I saw them watch, like same story, they watched me, you know what I mean? And I put them on blast for watching me. Then they called me and said, don't come back. Mm. That's a whole story. I catch casinos cheating all the time, by the way, and I film it and I post it. If you just like really look at my pages, I was with Tusi, you know, the, the, the hip hop artist, and uh, we're playing and I'm not going to say the name of the casino. He was playing. I was, just, I was just there and I says, hey man, and when the cameras were rolling the whole time, never cut, right? And I said, hey man, you want to know a trick? He goes, all right, so I'm going to prove to you they're cheating. He goes, go ahead. So I bet you the next car, that, next car that comes out of the shoe, and I just walked up. Mm -hmm. I just took a look. I watched like two hands. I bet you the next car that comes out of the shoe is a three of clubs. He goes, all right, bet, you're on. He opens, next car that came out was a three of clubs. And the whole time the camera was rolling. And he was like, he was like, he was like aghast. He was like, how, how, you know? And I says, just for clarity, can you tell the camera exactly what happened? And mind you, the camera's watching. The, car, the camera's there. It's got me here, Tusi there, and the card's in the middle. How were you able to film the, the, this? We just do what we do. Okay. You know? We just, we just do it. Okay. You know? <laughs> I don't know. We just do. Okay. Yeah, we just do. Um, 
casinos used to let me do anything I wanted. Yeah. You know, they used to let me. I used to stand on top of the tables and just scream, you know, obscenities. And I used to make a lot of jokes. I love, like, trying to be funny. And I I've met a lot of fucking people in my life. And Mickey is the number one, like, finesser. I, he's such a good talker. I don't even hear what he says half the time. Mm. But, like, I just sit back and, like, if there's something that can't be done, he'll be like, hold on, hold on, hold on. And go, like, run around, do his little thing. And then all of a sudden, like, we're doing it. And I'm, I, I nonstop. I don't know. It's <laughs> I think they're starstruck He's, by my really charmingly good looks, and I think they confuse me for Brad Pitt a lot. That's what happens. That's what we. That, that's what happened with my uh, crew here. They thought, <laughs> "How did we have Brad Pitt on today?" Yeah, that's yeah. Exa exactly what happened. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you another question. Um, so this is <laughs> now you've talked about this on several other podcasts. I'm not going to go over the specifics of this, but you said you would be gambling, and then you'd have two or three women a day wanting to have sex with you in different rooms. Under so you'd have a suite, and then underneath mm -hmm. the suite, you would have your assistant set up all these rooms with all these other girls. Yeah, for sure. I actually want to ask Brandy about this. Yeah, please do, Brandy. So how? Uh, so uh, so do you understand for my my audience? This, <laughs> this is funny. Um, so for my audience, like this is not relatable. I'm not saying I believe or don't believe. What I'm saying is this is very unrelatable. Can you help me make this relatable to normal? dudes how that is because he's saying he's not paying them right? right and there's a bunch of then there's a bunch of girls like how many girls are we talking about waiting for you like well, for the record i live in brand for the last like nine months yeah i've been living in her guest room yeah. here in vegas so she, she was firsthand to everything yes so for, sure. for sure that's why i'm asking because yeah. listen I, I again that's why i'm asking you this is part of the reason why i brought okay. you on okay? okay so what explain from your perspective how he's able to have, like how many, when you had one of these suites and there was all these girls waiting for you, how many girls are we talking about? 15 girls, five, six girls, what are we talking about? As many as he wants. Like, right, it, okay, but how, But so, so do you understand how this is outside the reality of 99% of the male population on this planet? Make it, make it realistic. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do, okay. Yeah. The best way to explain it, so he's got his main page, he's got what we call like a party page okay. on Instagram. Okay. And it's girls only on there, they're vetted out, they're, you know, fangirls from his main page. And I, the only way I can, again, he's like really great finesser, so I don't know if that plays a part in it, but. And I the, look like Brad Pitt. The only way, like I could see it from outsider in is like, he's got a lot of clout. He's okay. constantly with famous rappers and, you know, all kinds of artists and whatever. He clearly has a lot of money, drives a McLaren, like all this stuff. And he's got a large following and like girls are clout chasers. Girls want guys with money. Girls want like it's I mean, it, to me, it's not that crazy. It's not that crazy. Okay. And no, because it's so easy. It's, it's like, just the part is that they're waiting in different rooms that the assistants set up. They don't care. Like okay, they just it. want their 15 minutes. You okay. know what I mean? And so it's like. And, and every girl thinks, like, if they can get in front of him, if they can get his attention for even a little bit, that they can, like, you know, get it for longer. And, like, you know, every girl likes for to sure. think, Try like, to change I, I can change him. Trying to change I'll him. I'll be it. the one. You okay. know what I mean? And, and even if they're not, they don't care. They want to participate. They want to be invited to other stuff. They want to be around, like, what he has to offer. For sure. And they think that if they can get their 15 minutes with them, they'll, they'll figure it out a way, I guess. Or they just, I mean, there's... <laughs> I'm trying to be careful with my words. Are there ever um, situations where like you're like, damn, you got her? Or like you, you he went outside of your expectations? I don't like not really. Like it doesn't surprise me. Like yeah. he has gone like out of his league, if that's what you're saying. Yeah. But it doesn't surprise <laughs> me. So you there's never a reaction from you. <laughs> no, no. I'm so used to it. And I like I'm so like I see it. And I like like, like I said, clear, to me, it's clear not... cut girl. You just did not expect this. It just kind of came out of left field. You never see that. He's pulled girls that in my head, I'm like, I didn't expect that girl to be like that. Yeah. But not like, I'm not surprised that he was able to pull it off. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes. I love that she's explaining it. I just thought it'd be better to have her. I agree. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Now from your, from your expectation. Mm -hmm. So you understand. So I, I have a, a, a coaching a course, a, a, I am a coach in the Men of Action Mentoring Group. And one of the things we talk about is networking. We talk about connecting with people. We talk about social circle, this kind of stuff. To a lot of my audience, they're going to have a hard time understanding how, like, what is the interaction that you're having? Because you talk about you're really good at connecting with people. Adam22, in a different interview, mm -hmm. not the one he did with you, he talked about he has, an, he has a, an intern who became best friends with one of the porn stars that used to come on the show. And because they became best friends, he got invited to fucking everything. And it just and opened. And you just said it right there. Yeah. So these girls, like you said, like, they don't, they see his lifestyle on the internet and the people he knows and the stuff he's doing and all that stuff. And they don't even care if it's for one night. They're like, I want to experience that. Yeah. They want to have fun, even if it's just for one night. And, yeah. they, and they don't care where their place is in that. I, I am a lot of fun. And my life is really fun. I will say that. Yeah. I don't blame them. 
Oh, yeah. Really? So you, like, it's like you said, like they see that and they're like, oh, I want to be a part of that. And I'm, if, I'm still just trying to make this relatable to like Joe Schmo from, from Des Moines. Joe Schmo uh, doesn't have anything to offer though. If right. this dude's famous and got money and is around celebrities and doing all this stuff, then these girls will come to Joe Schmo, but Joe Schmo's Joe Schmo. Like you, yeah. you got to have something that this girl's like, I want to take a drive in his car and I want to go to this party and I want to meet these people. And would you say 99% of this, this, you showing this status and value comes from social media? We say the majority of it comes from that. Well, actually, not. I think the majority of it shows in its real life. So, so, so I think what you were leading to is, um, is the connecting part. Like, mm -hmm. how do I connect to all these types of women? Yes, because right? women from all walks of life, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I think something that works in my advantage, maybe is one of my strongest points, is uh, my ability to to pick up on social cues. Okay. So, it, you know, like people say like reading the room, right? So it's really easy, I think, to I don't want to say it's easy, but for me, it's second nature for me to identify people's social intelligence and I don't want to use the word exploit because that, that sounds too negative uh, but relate to where they're at socially at that moment so in reading the room everybody has their own life within that same room so if you can say to yourself well I see uh, you know Brandy sitting over there all her friends are really wild but she's stuck on her phone there's really only one one reason she's on her phone is because she's arguing with her boyfriend mm. who did not come that night so I can say, I now know something about her that she doesn't know I can use, not against her, but with her. Yeah. I'd be like, I'd be like hey, uh, I see you like really struggling on your phone. You got boyfriend problems? And, and depending on her reaction, I will immediately know how willing she is to go outside her relationship. Mm. She'll be like, no, me and my boyfriend are good. He just is having a rough night, and I think I'm going to go home and see him. I know that door is shut. I'm wasting no more time. I'm going to find somebody else. But if she goes, no, no, I don't got a boyfriend. Just, you know, somebody's just messaging me, work stuff, work stuff. I'll be like... I see you, baby. You know, why don't I take you on stage? Why don't I take you on stage and forget about this work stuff? And you go, oh, you can get me on stage? I'm like, yeah, of course. What do you mean? And I'm like, all right, bet I'm with it. You know, and, and that applies in every scenario. That's interesting. So there is a sorting of, of, of I sorts. I feel like a majority of it lately has been fangirls. I get a lot of fangirls. I got to be honest. Definitely fangirls. Yeah. But but in I have like a lot of real life personable, you know, interactions yeah. that, that lead to conversions and closing the deal, you know. Okay. But for sure, for yeah. sure, Fangirls is very helpful. Last night we had an encounter. I will say this though, I um I have a I've been I've had a girlfriend for a year and a half, and she told me that she would castrate me if I didn't shout her out on this. So so here's to you, sniper. Um, uh, I I stopped 90 days ago when Brandy and I both decided to change our lives. I also stopped sleeping around, um, and I'm like exclusive with my girl, and I love my girl and all this. And, um, what makes her different? I mean, you had all these other options. Why did we stop with this one girl? She sticks around. She, yeah, she definitely stuck around for sure. She puts in. She's she puts in effort. Yeah, like she's yeah. she's different. I I know her. She's different. Mm. She's different. She um we met on like a total neutral playing field. Like we met in a scenario where for sure we only wanted sex from each other. Mm. And, you know, we were, like, having sex with other people. We were having sex with other people together, all of these things. And, like, for sure we were good. Then we started connecting emotionally. And she became, like, like my bottom. You know what I mean? Like, she, like my bottom chick. Like, you know, she's, like, the go-to. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm aware. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and I uh, made, like, a dramatic decision at, like, 7 a.m. I hadn't slept for three days. I was on a gambling binge. Yeah. And we're at my, my – I have a penthouse in, in LA and me, her and two of my buddies were in the house and none of us had slept. We'd all been gambling for three days and she was just partying. And I says, um, I says, I want to leave. I says, I want to move to Vegas right now. Mm. I'm like, what do you mean? And I said, like, like you all have 30 seconds to either grab my spare key and stay in my penthouse or pack your bags and we're moving to Vegas. And I looked at her and I said, do you want me to drop you off at your house? She goes, no, I'm going to come. I got my bag packed. And then we just, she just moved, we got a house and she just moved in. And uh, so for nine months we lived together in Vegas, you know, it just like happened that way. And she um, did not care about the parties, the social media. Like she was like, I just want to chill, man. And uh, we just connected on that level and we got to know each other so well, so fast, so hard that I was like, yeah, she's different. And Brittany's absolutely right. She's, she's genuine. Like yeah. she genuinely cares about him and knows him on like a much deeper level. So, so. She's a writer. So. You have a girlfriend, but is there any polygyny left? Like, is it just her? There's nobody else? As of 90 days ago, just her, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you were, you did mention before about the orgies, are these polyamorous orgies? Are these like, are there men and women involved or is it yeah. just women? Okay. Yeah, men oh. and women, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I just, I, um, 
there's, I don't want to say, someone's going to take this out of context, like misquote me, you yeah. know what I mean? I, I, I don't think I can answer more. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're like, you understand what I'm asking. Yeah. 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 I mean, because there's a, a common question. This, I mean, this show is about evolutionary psychology and a lot of people, my last guest, uh, Jen Rufo, she believes that more men would be into cuckolding if they would go to therapy. And I'm like, I don't agree with you, Jen. I don't agree with you at all. But it's a really interesting conversation. And, and it's just, it's just funny because like, uh, some dudes are, are comfortable with other guys being around and some guys are not comfortable with it. And it's, it's just a very interesting... I think those that are uncomfortable with other guys being around are low-key really nervous they're gay. There's usually, like, some some of the stuff, there's as many guys as there is girls. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes they just, like, sit guys. there and pass them around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, imagine me and a couple of my boys... Are you, like, getting Gatorade and stuff like that? No, I don't. I don't go. Like he knows. Like I, I like I have, even I, parties I have, and stuff. I don't usually go to. Like I'm a huge homebody, and I like me and him do dinners together. That's our time together. I, but I, I, I see a lot of videos in the I, group. There. I have a girl who brings in uh, hair ties and brings me Gatorade. Yeah, exactly. That was, cat, that was catfish. I'm saying, yeah, I'm yeah. saying too much. <laughs> we, we had a water. Well, I, know, I know catfish. Yeah, catfish yeah, was the, our The wa- fucking BMX dude. He was the yeah. water boy. He was our water boy. I love catfish. That dude is hilarious, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's my dog. Yeah, yeah he's he a like, videographer too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the, he's the announcer for the Olympics and the X Games and Metro yeah. Circus and the Pro BMX. Yeah, that's yeah he was our water boy for a little while for all the orgies. We had gone on like a like a, a West Coast orgy tour. You know, mm. we just like travel through all these cities, like a mob of us just sleeping around. Okay, okay. We are outside just, of the reality of normal people. How do you, so I go to a city where I don't know anyone. How do I invoke an orgy? How does that happen? Um, I don't, just for the record, I don't participate. No, I know. Wink, yeah. wink. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so kidding. great. I'm so just good. kidding. I'm so just great. kidding. So I'm how do you, kidding. how do you, so I, I go to, let's put a city that you don't live in. What's a pick a city? Uh, I don't live in uh, New York. Okay, so New York. How do you invoke an orgy in New York and you don't... How does that work? So, New York might have been back because I lived in New York. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me just say like a random city. I don't know. Okay, Sacramento I go to a, or yeah, something. Yeah, I go to, I've never been to Sacramento in my life. Okay. Okay, so I go to Sacramento. And I... So, I know some girls that I've had orgies with in the past mm. that are from Sacramento. So, in real life, what I would do is I'd hit up those girls. By the way, those same girls from Sacramento, they call me very frequently... And they'd be like, hey, I'm with five of my girls. We're looking to share a dick. Are you in LA? Right? So what I would do in real life, if I went to SAC and I wanted orgies, I would call one of those girls and be like, hey, I'm in SAC. Who here is down with the get down? And one of those girls would be like, one sec, I got you. Blah, blah, blah. Group thread. I'm talking to the new girl. I'm like, hey, yo, this is where I'm at. Do you want me to send a driver for you? And so for the record, when you're saying like Joe Schmo doesn't know any of this or like how to approach a girl, there's no like he's so blunt. He's so upfront. He's so straightforward. Like there is no like game behind it. It's just like, hey, are you down or are you not down? This is what we're doing. So there's no like working into it. If that's what you're trying to get. No, no, like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get any, of other yes. people who are like, how is he pulling this off? He just straight. He's very blunt and he's and and the girls usually are too. This is like the the social networking at a different level than anyone's ever heard of. It's like, hey, I have a social network of people down for the get down. You know what I'm saying? But like, it's so common. Yeah, no, it's for so sure. So common. That's that's and uh, then they share. So then he knows about this. And if he's got a friend that's like, Hey, I'm in Sacramento, he's like, Oh, I, I had some girls I was with, like, let me pass them along. They, let me put they're part of the network. Yeah. Now. It's an MLM. Yeah, it's a big right. it's an orgy MLM. They're that's in now. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You also talked about like, so I, I'll tell you right now, um, I find, this is just my opinion, mm-hmm. uh, when I see for, for men, the blue check mark meaning less and less because I see so many men buying them, specifically men, like uh, specifically men who sell some kind of course because uh, he and I both don't have one. Mm-hmm. And I have, there are 20 fake accounts of me. There are actually guys going on fake accounts of me and inviting girls to go to photo shoots like it's actually dangerous Meanwhile, like, i can't even get one yeah like it, but, but my point my point is my point my point is my, my point is instagram is like literally putting women in danger rather than giving me a blue check mark like that's yeah, a, that's that's accountability though you can't get put in danger if you're not if you're not vetting out and figuring out stuff yourself but, you know I, but I mean? it, it but it's happened i'm telling you it's happened i know it's, it's yeah. i'm yeah it's like getting catfish you know what i mean but I but, mean, but like, at some point it's verification it what the blue check mark was not supposed to be a status symbol it's supposed to be verification yeah okay verifying so like that you are who you say you are. Which, which would help when it, we, we come into a situation where somebody's trying to use my image to traffic motherfuckers. That's the point I'm trying to make. Like they are specifically like not using this for what it was for. And then the other problem is we talked about this before. It was one of the most aggravating things. The Instagram can take your account away and then I can call some guy in fucking Turkey and pay him five grand to bring my account back. Like if you're at Instagram and you hear these stories about a motherfucker in Turkey who's bringing accounts back, how do you not have any integrity? Like, how do you go to work every day and just not feel like a loathsome piece of shit that you were just like, not only are we taking girls' accounts away because they're wearing a bikini, like just, just again, Instagram, I'm gonna keep reiterating this. Breasts are not sexually suggestive. 
by themselves. They're not. For some reason, women with curves on TikTok are just getting banned like left and right just because they have it'll, curves. It'll never go away, though. I mean, like, but it's, it's, it's there's, just, there's so many flaws in social media. There's no way they're going to perfect it. It's, it's so crazy to me. I just wish somebody would make a, a fucking a platform where we go back to like 2014 terms of service where if you wear a bikini and you're not fingering yourself, then that's okay. I agree. Because that's okay. That's not fucking sexually suggestive to wear a bikini. It is not, it is not, someone is not asking for sex because they are wearing a bikini. I don't understand how these social media platforms cannot grasp this. It is like so outside of their reality. That's the other thing. I'll say this too. The fucking shit where like nobody hates women more than Instagram. This whole thing where they banned Andrew Tate. TikTok. The, well, sure, TikTok too. But like oh, they banned Andrew Tate because they're trying to be a champion for women. How about all the women where you just take their goddamn account away for no reason? You, you ban them for animal cruelties they don't even have animals on their account how and about take their the away. women that spew nonsense and false information yeah there, there is a whole, leading whole, whole, feminists but they're actually morons there's a there's a podcast called kill all men there's uh uh C -A -K -K -A -M. <laughs> kill all men look it up guys stop what you're doing right now go on apple podcast look up kill all men it is absolutely it's a man it's a woman on the artwork she has a knife and there's a bunch of men in front of her that she's going to kill kill all men is a podcast and it is absolutely it is absolutely promoted by Apple Podcasts. You're right. You're correct. It is not no problem with it whatsoever. Again, you Instagram, Meta, you are not a champion for women all of a sudden. You are a fucking hypocrite. You are allowing people to buy their accounts back. You're allowing people to buy blue check marks. You're allowing people to buy fake followers. You're doing nothing about it. So in this case, when I see this whole this hypocritical bullshit where they banned Andrew Tate because they're trying to like stop human trafficking, it's just so aggravating to me. Well, how about we fix the problem at home first before we start worrying about people that are like saying shit on the other side of the world. They're just making an example out of people. I mean, it's just, it's so crazy to me, man. I, that, that thing made me so angry because I'm like, dude, I still got friends that like were making a living and you just take their living away for no fucking reason because they have a butt. Because their butt is round, you want to take their shit away. But if they look like a 12 year old, they're perfectly fine to, to post on TikTok. I'm sorry, I, I, forgive me for my rant. I apologize. Right. Anyway, the thing is, you, you mentioned this before. I find the blue check mark to be less and less. And obviously, if I get one, I'll be like super fucking happy. But at the same time, I'm finding it to be less and less relevant because I'm seeing so many people get it for the wrong reason. Do you understand what I'm saying? Relevant yeah. in what way? Um, I, I Before, I thought it was actually like a legitimate well, status symbol. We were talking about girls, so in my mind, I'm thinking you're nah, saying nah, like. Nah. No, girls, girls and guys. And like, no, I'm He's saying anybody has a blue check mark. You could have a thousand followers and be literally nobody and just pay five, ten bands and get a blue check mark. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's people diluting. We were talking about sex with girls and I thought you were just saying like if you have a blue check mark, you're consigning these girls. No, no, no. So, oh, so okay. no, what I'm saying is what I'm saying is when those blue check marks first came out, it yeah, was a yeah, pretty yeah, yeah. I know some girls, my friend Candace was talking about, yeah, I only pretty much answer if the guy's got a blue check mark. And now it's like I see these people and they're like forex traders or they're fucking selling a crypto. I avoid people with blue check marks. Yeah, yeah. The that's plague. there you go. That's my you are making my exact fucking point for me it's getting to the point now where it's like the blue check whenever i see a dude who is not the point guard for the lakers and he has a blue check mark and he has like fifty thousand followers my like alarm bells just start going off on my head like who who every from, every wannabe rapper with 30 thank you followers. thank you that's exactly my point it makes it devout like instagram Forex is, traders yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure like oh my god check out this crypto product like a four yeah, thousand yeah. percent return guaranteed except and your boy i like your boy that we had dinner with but your brother yeah, yeah. I like him. He's got a blue check mark, but I, re I think he earned it. PJ Matlock, he's legit. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you that's, get news articles. That's my dog now. Yeah. <laughs> but the point is, I feel like they're devaluing their own product. Um, yeah. I by, al by allowing. By I agree 100%. Uh, so I, I figure you're gonna ask me why I don't have a blue check. No, I know why you're like I, you don't have because I don't have one. Yeah. And I, like, m dude, I have news articles written about me all over the place. I've been on like four fucking reality TV shows, and I have like a bunch of videos with 15 million views. It, trust me, they're actually people trying to traffic human beings using my image. I if I don't have a blue check mark, I know why you don't have one. It doesn't make any sense. It's because I don't want to play the game, and I don't want to play some guy in fucking Turkey yeah. to go get me one. That's the reason. Uh, why. Because of my friends like him, I actually go for guys who have like no following and no check marks. Interesting. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Ready, everybody out there with no following and no check mark, hit her up at Brandy. Slide in my B DMs. Do not have a blue check. Brandy mark. B Andrews. If, if you, you're 19 to 25 and you're from a small town with no blue check, Brandy's the girl for you. Brandy's all about it, man. Make sure you're broke. Also, that's yeah. another thing. She's into that as yeah. well. That's what they're all. Uh, I think blue check marks are um, not just diluted and overplayed. But imagine this. Imagine Drake didn't have a check mark. Yeah. How freaking cool would that be? That would be pretty cool. Uh, hey, dude. What about a what about a way to take a stand if somebody did that? Like like Kanye did that. There's like, take away my blue check mark. That's like, how I feel about it. Yeah. I believe that I can. But then everyone would question if it was his real page. Yeah, but he could nah, still prove it. Bro, he could go on there and make a video. Yeah, bro. He's got 20 or 40, 50 million followers. Nah, nah. It's definitely. Yeah. You know what I mean? So 
nah, everyone's gonna know it's Drake or, or, or Yee. Like, they're gonna know, like, for sure. Because every time someone slides in your DMs and it's someone big, and you're like, oh my God, like, why is this guy in my DMs? You're like, is this really him? And oh, that's another like thing. Have you, have you guys seen this? So I get hit up by these people every single day. It's oh a blue check God. mark, 400,000 followers, a million followers. Yeah. And they're like, hey, we wanna sell you this growth thing. And they're like, hey, they just write, hey. Oh. And I'm like, dude, get the fuck out of here. Like, I understand what you're doing. Like, you have got to see my responses to these people. Oh, well, dude, send oh them to me. I just, I just block them. But I just oh, like, nah, to me, nah, it's nah, like, nah, nah. how have 10 people with blue check marks and 400,000 followers messaged me this week? Yeah. And all of them, it's like so now obviously it's in the millions. fake. They all have like two to five it's million, so but they look at their page and it's like their likes are paid for, their comments yes. are paid for. Their it's six, a comment from the, sixty the same account sixty times on. They there. have a million followers and six thousand views on their reel. Yeah, yeah, it's bonkers, man. I do like the fact that real views are up there because it can, you can kind of tell a little bit more yeah. legitimacy with with people. But yeah, man, I just feel like if if everyone's cheating at some point, then what's the point of any of it? You know. I, I think that if I applied standard through the app, I think I just get the blue check. To be yeah. honest, um, I think it's kind of, I think it's edgier that I don't. Interesting. I think it's kind of cool. Edgier. I think that's something you don't need to work a ton on, man. I know. I, just I think, think it's Mickey. Cool, I think that's a strength man. that you have is edginess. I think. I think it's I'm cool. the one who probably needs to work. I'm the. I'm the fucking Protestant cisgendered former military officer. I'm the one who needs to work on the edginess. I think something else interesting about my social media. Yeah. So a lot of the a, a list celebrity friends I have, they they constantly are commenting to me on this. They go, and I, and I think it's true, so I guess I could just say it without sounding egotistical, but I'm way more famous than my social media pages lead on to be. You know, so like on TikTok, I got like uh, 350,000 followers. Yeah. But not just as my engagement above those with like five, six, seven million followers. Yeah. But I also have incredibly more exposure. I have, you know, hundreds of millions of views on every social media platform, on YouTube, all this. You know, I have like this way bigger reach than His guys. following's lower, but his following is strong yeah you should show that you should show the insights i mean that's what that's i, oh, I, I have can. some other i have some other friends who are who are influencers and they it's really funny so they'll show their following and then they'll show nike and then they'll show their uh engagement per reel and or per story and then they'll show nikes and they're like i didn't pay for any of this you know what i'm saying and by the way that's a threat to nike that's also a threat to Instagram. Well, because like I have a lot of friends who have like millions and millions of followers, and we go out together all the time. Like whatever, he has like around three, four hundred k. Yeah. And when we, he gets approached more than anybody, I really, I, yeah. And I hang out with like a lot of people, yeah. and he, he second most approached person I've ever hung out with. Like walking through casinos, restaurants, everything. I it's, take it, it's insane. I take at least ten fan photos every That's day crazy. in any city when I go outside. Yeah. There's this certain like corridor of like crypto, <laughs> fucking self help. Douchebag, sorry, don't, don't mean to say that. I'm famous with them, with everyone else. Nobody knows who the fuck I am. This is like yeah. certain small segment. Well, I guess and, it's because he's a gambler and we're walking through Vegas for most sure, of the time, of but course. even in LA and other places. In LA, New York, right? Yeah, whatever city I'm in. Obviously, it's mo for your for what you see, it's mostly visual in Vegas, yeah. where it's the most of our time together. But yeah, it's any city I'm in, it's at least 10 fan photos a day. That's crazy. Last night, oh my God, I feel so bad. So we went out last night and we did whatever, and uh, my bodyguard. So we're walking through these cabanas on a second floor at some club or whatever. And these two kids like double took like, oh my God, that's Mickey. And one of the kids turned around and just like kind of like went to, it was like kind of next to us, you know? And he went to turn around and just like ex give like a physical exclamation like, oh my God, it's so cool to meet you. And my bodyguard just smashed this dude up oh, against no. the wall. <laughs> it was so unnecessary. Yeah, it was so aggressive. And this dude is big, you know? And this is some kid, you know, like just some 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 average size. Is this where is this, like Zook? Uh, last, this was... Uh, this was while we were at Excess last night. Excess, okay. We went to a lot of places last night, but this was yeah. during Excess. <laughs> and he just shoves this kid, and a guy, and the kid was like, "Yo, I'm just, I'm just trying to say hello." And he goes, "Nah, he don't need that. He's da da da." -da. <laughs> and we just keep walking, and, and so I, I, I did what I did. I told the body guy, I said, hey, "I'm gonna go back over there." So we walked over, and I went and I said, "Hey guys, I'm, you know, I'm really sorry. You know, I got a little excited there, and you know, we hung out for a bit." And I've seen a few. Um, that's not normal, by the way, either. Like, it's not he's, normal. He's, anybody who comes up to him, he's always nice and takes yeah. pictures. He doesn't. I think it's the coolest thing when people ask me for photos. I'm just like, yeah, some for dude, sure, man. You know, I'm just some dude, and to be recognized, and people like are seeking me out for fan photos. Like the coolest thing. It's the most humbling, like coolest experience I could feel. It's really, really cool to be honest, and I enjoy it. And, and it's just cool to interact with people who are showing appreciation and love for the things I post. Again, I've never made a dollar. I've never made a single dollar on social media. I don't make money yeah. by exposing my life and my inner self for people to try to attack or this or make opinions or that. That's you know, for me to put myself out there so vulnerably and 
to finally see, not finally, but, but the times that I do, let's say 10, 10 people a day that ask me for a photo, to see 10 different people from random cities, random walks of life, from all different reasons that they've ever known who I was, whatever like attracted them to me, to come show love and appreciation, the reciprocity makes me feel really good. It goes, you know what, this was worth it. So if you're not making money from social media, where would you say the majority of your income is coming from now? So like me and Brandon were talking about in the beginning about our financial welfare is taking an impact. Yeah. I had sort of stopped. I'd just been on like this party tip, you know? I'd been on this party tip for like a year. And I wasn't really doing much. The thing, I was doing a lot. Let me rephrase. I was doing a lot, but because I was so thinned out, you know? There's a lot of distractions. A lot of distractions. I couldn't hardly convert much. You know, mm. how can I, if I, if so I, you weren't making a bunch we of money. We were wasting yeah, no, time and energy on yeah. things that were not productive. Okay, got I it. I wasn't making a lot of money for the last year. I had, you know, I had a lot of money and that was sort of where it ended. You know, I was like, I'm going to chill. I'm going to party. I'm going to light money on fire. I'm going to live my best life. And by the end of it, I'm like, I want to do business. I'm engaging in incredible business meetings and conversations and yeah. relations. And I said, why can't I close these deals like I used to be able to close them before social media? And I said, oh, yeah, because I'm jerking around with all these dickheads in my life. Are you still playing poker, cash games, the yeah. World Series of Poker? Yeah. Do people still stake you? Um, bro, honestly, man, I was never, like, really big on getting staked. Okay. It, like, kind of happened by accident. I would uh, play for some of my friends because we're just friends. Like, why would I not try to feed my team, you know? Yeah. And some of my friends happen to be famous. So when they post about it, it gets this exposure. And then other famous people ask me, and I'm like, um, this seems really fun for me. I was like, this seems like a cool experience to have with a person that I've idolized my whole life. For sure. I said, let me do it. Then they post about it. Then I start getting attacked by all these, how do you say, like, no-name people. I mean, not respectfully, but, like, you yeah. know, non-public figures. Just regular mm. people. Just people. Just attacking me relentlessly. Gamble for me. Give me money. Gamble for me. Gamble for me. Gamble for me. And I'm like, yo, you got a hundred dollars. What do you want me to? What yeah. do you want me to do with your hundred dollars? Or they just want to meet him and talk to him. And they say they have money and they want him to gamble it, and they don't. Who 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 uh, who are some of the people that you've gambled for? Oh, like everybody, everybody. Um, I don't know, man. Like everybody. Name uh, drop. Huh? A name drop. I mean, a name drop. <laughs> I can tell you this. Uh, Ronnie J, the producer. I have to meet him in an hour and a half in L.A. We're gonna mm. go play. Uh, the next day, I'm going to be with DDG. Um, so that's like my next so, so that we, 12 we have, hours. We have coaching, and then we also have people like uh, giving you money. You have celebrities give you money to gamble? Yeah. I'm obviously Mikey from Impulsive. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's my dog. Yeah. I want a million bucks for him and Logan Paul. Okay. And Ryan Garcia. I'm going to play. Oh, I'm playing with Ryan on Thursday. Okay. Um, I'm playing against Ryan, actually. So, so for a lot of people might be confused. You're like, well, well, I'm not that famous. You went on, you talked to Mikey from Impulsive, and you also went on No Jumper. Like, that's yeah. that's about as big as it gets other than Lex Freeman and fucking Joe Rogan. Yeah. That's about as big as it gets, I have right? about 100, so there's about, a, I have about 100 million views on YouTube. The thing is that I have my own YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. It's also Dirty Goth Boy, same yeah. as my TikTok and Instagram, but I don't use it. So what I really do is I make appearances on everybody's page. You know, like when Lil Baby posts me, when 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 Drake posts me, when, when Key Glock posts me, when... Whoever it may be, when all these people are posting me, the exposure I'm getting is roughly a reach of one billion people. So one billion, roughly one billion people have seen my face and, and heard my name and know who I am. But it doesn't always convert to my page. Is what I was saying. How these guys are saying I'm way more famous than my Instagram looks. You know. Yeah. No. For sure. You know. So. But yeah. So. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Young Jeezy used to say, "I'm your favorite rapper's favorite rapper." Yeah, yeah. Right? Right, he's not yeah. the mo he's not the most famous rapper. But I think my favorite rapper's favorite rapper is Project Pat. Right, there's a reason why I want him on the show. I think he's like he gets hooked. His hooks and his samples are on everybody's album. They mix and screw his voice and all this kind of stuff. And you have no so most people don't even know who he is. And like that's who I uh, that's why I like him so much. You yeah. understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's almost like you might not be famous, but famous enough famous people know you. That it's it it in in those circles it would it would appear like that. Yeah. So like what Brandy was saying is, um, out of the uh, the few hundred thousand I have on Instagram, realistically, like fifteen percent of them are made up of like the top A list uh, celebrities in the world. Mm. So roughly, I have um, about a billion followers within the people that follow me. You know, so if they were to all post me, I get the exposure of about a billion people when, on the on my repo when people repost me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were hesitant to talk about crypto. Is there anything that you can say about your involvement with crypto? Um, there's going to be some crypto articles coming out in the near future as far as what my role was. When you're role, are we talking about being an investor? Did you do any coding? Like, what, what, what are we talking about your original role? Um, <clears throat> so I don't know if you're, maybe you are familiar, actually, if you're in the crypto scene, but there's... Um, 
an increased heated climate within certain roles in crypto. Okay. You, if you're following. I'm, I'm, my, my crypto exposure mainly comes from, uh, from Elevator Nights with, uh, with what's it, a Dan Fleischman. And, yeah. you know, my introduction from there and then my exploration came from that. And also I work in finance. So yeah. I saw maybe let me, let me try to rephrase well, it. When you say bit. heated, like I'm actually thinking about like servers getting too no, high. No, 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 no. Um, metaphorical. Okay. So <clears throat> before, I don't think I can say this on the air. My personal relations before crypto was on the scene, some of my best friends are some of the biggest figures in crypto. Mm -hmm. And this all happened before, before crypto. So when they had blown up in crypto, they sort of asked me to participate in a lot of roles. Even that word doesn't sound right. I'm not sure how I can appropriately phrase this. Okay. I can tell you off the air. That's what I can do. I okay, can tell you off the sounds air. good. I do think there's going to be crypto articles. There will be crypto articles releasing in the not so distant future in regards to some of my roles. Okay. But there's a lot of legalities in what's allowed to be released and what's allowed to be for disclosed. sure. That, that's it, what I'm getting at. It's funny uh, when you talk about the legality. So uh, Richard Crab, who is he makes this, he has this hedge fund called Numerai, and I had him. Uh, he's done some podcasts before, and I invited him to come on. And he's like, he goes after I went on Lex Freeman, he's like the SEC contacted me, and they were like, I can't talk about this stuff because Th thank of, you. There you because of thank compliance you. issues. Thank so you. I work for a hedge fund and there's certain things like I can't come on here and like advertise my fund because I'll get in deep Th shit with the SEC go. because of it. So I, I do understand with some, there are some regulatory uh, issues there. Um, I do want to say thank you for clarifying that because I know there's going to be people trying to do these hit pieces on me that are going to pull what I just said and say, oh, look, he was part of pump and dumps. That's not true, by the way. I yeah. never did a pump and dump. So, so the way it works is with, especially with hedge funds, with a mutual fund or something like that, you can advertise that to whoever you want. You can buy TV ads on that. For things that involve accredited investors, so this is a accredited investor, somebody with a net worth over a million dollars, you have to like, they literally have to come to you. Right, you can't take out a Facebook ad for like my hedge fund that gets forty percent return because we're selling stock options. That kind of stuff is illegal. So a lot of people don't realize how, how that works or how a hedge fund works. Basically, you don't have to register with the Security Exchange Commission. I believe it's forty clients and twenty-five million, or twenty-five clients and forty million. I forgot exactly how it is, but there's some level at, at which point you're too big, and then all of a sudden you you start getting regulated. Um, the, but going anyway, go back to what we said before. Um, the uh, th there was another thing. There's a bunch of things on World Series of Poker about some insane bluffs that you make. So first of all, I want to know, are the what causes you to make the bluff when you don't have a strong hand, and then in the end, your decision to show the cards versus not show the cards for a novice audience who doesn't understand poker. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> uh, something that is one of my stronger suits is um, live reads. Okay. Right. So. People discuss like uh, pupils dilating. Uh, you can see like increased heart rate through you know. Blood. This is why this is why these guys are wearing glasses. Yeah, times. yeah. yeah. Uh, you could see you know if you watch like veins and you could see like uh, you know. Have you read blood Blink? Pressure. Have you read Blink by uh, Malcolm Gladwell? He talks about micro expressions. So I have a, a, a funny thing about uh, reading books. I was a very very prevalent reader. I read a lot. Yeah. At a certain time in my life. Uh, long story short, I start. Right oh yeah, right there. Yeah. I started uh, down a path in an exploration to find the answer of what is God. And I did this on my own, right? By my own fruition. And on this journey, I had stumbled upon a lot of people uh, and a lot of information that I probably wasn't supposed to be so privy to. And um, I started finding myself getting in trouble with uh, interesting people uh, for so, not that I was sharing this information, I didn't have social media until recently, but uh, just as far as searching and having conversations about it. And I found myself in a room uh, with a group of people, including the guy who, who actually, he cured cocaine addiction uh, here in America. And the government came and they shut him down and they quieted him how up. Did, how did he cure cocaine addiction? So very similar to naltrexone, right? Okay. For opiates. Oh, so uh, it's a, it's medication. A medication. Medication, got it, yeah. okay. He found a medication that would... Uh, uh, so what happens when, you, when you're doing cocaine, it has to do a lot with the receptors. They get swollen. They crave more. Mm -hmm. And the cocaine is filling them at rapid rates. Mm -hmm. So you get the serotonin, yeah. and et cetera. And he found a way to uh, unswell them and basically make your brain normal. Same, okay. like, basically the same like opiates, Got it. but for cocaine. The problem is the government's making so much money off cocaine addiction from the top to the bottom. The selling the drugs, the, the uh, institutions and people go into the judicial system due to cocaine, people that are addicted to cocaine, the rehabs, all, all this stuff happened. So they shut them down, you know, and it makes sense. And so I found myself in a room with him amongst other powerful and incredibly intelligent people. And they said to me, I, what happened by the end of it was I came up with two plans on how to take over the world. They were theoretical. They were both possible. They're both doable. And one of them was being done and probably is being done. 
I could never do them. I don't, I knew at the time, like, I can't do anything about this. I just know that it exists. So I found myself in this meeting and basically these people looked at me and they said, listen, they said, you're about to cross the point and overturn. What do you think you're going to achieve if you keep down, going down this route? Are you going to solve it? Are you going to fix it? Are you going to take over the world? I said, no, I'm not capable. It's not, it's not me. They said, so what are you doing? They said, either right now you pack it in and call it a day and that's the end of it, or this is it. You know, this is where you're going to be. Then you can only go so far down this route. And I thought and I thought and I thought and, and my family was involved. And um, I said, I quit. I said, I can know what I would think I know or know what I do know, but it's not relevant. It doesn't help me. I can't do anything. So at that exact moment, I put myself, until this day, I've been in like a fear in regards to reading too much. I, I'm actually nervous to get educated on anything that is not directly productive to, to whatever mm, my specific okay. goal is. So for me to read all these things, I think I'll get incredibly educated. But what good is some of it? And will some of it cause more panic and paranoia in my life? Uh, I would then I would recommend the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Like yeah, Mark no, Manson I'm familiar. Yeah, I'm familiar. And uh, yeah. the power of now by Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. Uh, so so um, the the other thing I want to ask you. So when we go back to the bluffing, yeah, right? Bluffing, I'm yeah. very interested in this. This is the 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 score a touchdown, block a field goal part of of poker, right? Uh, that that a lot of people watch. What caused so in those insane poker bluffs that you see, you can see clips of on the World Series of Poker YouTube site on their YouTube channel. What is going through your head? Are you just like, fuck it? Is it an adrenaline rush? Or are you just like reading them? Is there a thing that you see that causes you to, uh, to push in when there's $300,000 in chips on the floor and you, you, don't ha you know you're not going to win? Yeah, so um, the first thing is uh, I'm familiar with GTO. If you're not, it stands for Game Theory Optimization. Right? Okay. And it is like the most structured way to play poker. It is mm -hmm. like the, the most core math of it. It goes mm. in this position, when this happens, and you have these cards, this is likely what they have, and this is likely how you should respond, and here's your equity, here's your percentage, here's what you're likely to be, whether you're behind or above, so you know how to make the right decision. It's like the most solved version yeah. of poker. So I'm familiar. And uh, so let's say I play outside that realm. There's a lot of these. Most poker players are nerds. Let me just be super clear. There's some that are for sure are like my boys, and they're like down with the get down. But yeah. A lot of them are just nerds, right? So when they're playing poker, they're like, GTO, GTO, GTO. If you're not GTO, you know, you're yeah. a rec player. I'm like, okay, buddy. So I'm watching them play GTO. I'll step outside that realm depending on the player, depending on the circumstances. Sometimes I just want to gamble and have fun. Yeah. That's at, at, the, at the core of it. Sometimes I'm just trying to have fun. So I'll be playing. I'll say, I know this guy's playing GTO. I understand where he's at. I know why he's making the decision he's making. I know what he's representing, and I know what I have. And, yeah. You know, I know the math behind it. I says, well, if he believes I'm playing GTO, then I can represent something I don't have, you know? And it just puts me in a position, and then I have to read on him. I have to say, he's playing GTO. Now, can I pick up a live read that's going to say that he's slightly deviating from where he's supposed to be? And mm. if so, then he's got... A marginal hand. And if you've got a marginal hand, and I'm continuously and consistently rep parallel representing a strong hand that he, through GTO, believes I have, then it's no loss. But there's also a ton of bad, bad, bad bluff spots. By the way, and I learned that the hard way. Because if you're following someone who's supposed to be playing GTO, and I didn't play it as if I have the hand correctly, I didn't play you know, through the uh, standard procedures of a poker hand, and then all of a sudden I make a giant bet at the end, the guy's like, it's an obvious bluff. I yeah. will call with a terrible hand, but it's better than your bad hand, and then I lose. So I went through a lot of those, you know, trial by fire. I was like, okay, that's not working. And I got incredible coaching from a lot of the World Series of bracelet winners, some of my best friends, and we just sit down and they go, listen, man, I, we played tonight, and when you made that one move, I'm going to tell you what was a bad call. I said, oh, thank you for that. They go, now, this is how you should have played it if your intention was to bluff at the end. I said, that makes perfect sense. Have you ever talked to Bobby Baldwin? I play with Bobby maybe twice a week. Very really? good friend of mine. Oh, very, me and Bobby, that's my dog. Do you, do you, I'm going to see Bobby tomorrow. Oh, I'm going to see Bobby today. Oh, that's I'm, crazy. Me and him are having dinner tonight. Um, a, he's the, apparently the one who was driving the car when uh, Steve Wynn's daughter was kidnapped. Dave, you ever heard this story? Uh, I don't, I don't want to get too much into that. I, I, I don't know anything. I, I don't, I don't it, was, know. it was, it was, it was crazy. I don't know if you ever read it, but it's yeah. pretty, pretty nuts. Like, uh, but yeah, I've heard that. And then Bobby's room is the, is the name of the high stakes room in the, the poker in, room in the Bellagio. In the Bellagio is named, named after, Bobby's room. There's also him. Bobby's burger some, somewhere. I can't remember where it is, but it's named in after Aria. Him. Yeah, that's correct. That's named after him. I didn't know that. Yeah. One. I believe that. I believe that's also named after Bobby Baldwin. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. yeah we have dinner tonight. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah very cool. Um, so, by the way, Bobby Baldwin was the 1979 World Series of Poker champion, and he's also the president of City Center, uh, which yeah. I don't know if he currently is anymore, but that's where the Aria and all he that. He was is. CEO of MGM for like 20 years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There he's you go. a big, Bobby Baldwin is like the biggest deal. Yeah, he is the biggest deal. Um, yeah. What else do you have coming up, man? Um, I got a lot of things coming up. Um, I do want to say one thing 
that I didn't get to say, but I planned on because I figured it was going to come out. When you, I figured you something about Spencer was going to come up. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was talking about that, he could not disprove me. And as a matter of fact, he mm -hmm. actually had no choice but to prove me. And it proved to him so much to the fact that he actually gave me money and bought me into one of the World Series of yeah. Poker events, right? And nobody else can disprove me. As a matter of fact, only everybody can continue to verify my claims, right? And how nobody has been able to come out and say anything's been not factual. I've never made a single claim that wasn't proven yeah. to be legitimate. Not a single person has ever came out. Yeah, the, right? the, the, pro the other problem I have is like, if, if, you, if it wasn't true, who are you hurting? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not like, you didn't ask any of us for money. And I don't like, if a girl wants to sleep with you, what fucking business is that of mine? Yeah. Like, you're, like, at some point, I'm like, dude, why are you, why do you give a shit? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, there's some, I have some friends of mine that make some claims that have to do with gambling that I just don't know if it's true or not. But I'm like, who are you hurting? Like, I don't really care one way or the other. You know what I'm saying? But like, or, or, or it's not even that. It's like, why, why have you not built a seven figure business? Why are you commenting on YouTube videos? Like, that's my, that's always my retort. That. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no problem. Yeah. But I just wanted to really drive home a certain point. Not only have I done a lot of this live on, on camera, like my winnings, my cash outs and all this, but do you have any idea what it would probably take to get that many incredibly filthy, rich, powerful, influential A-list people to come forward and all collaborate and and have the exact same... How can that many people tell the same lie about sure, me? Yeah. It's the most absurd thing, you know? Or why would they? Yeah, why would they? How can I possibly incentivize all these people? And like, I don't... What, am I going to pay them? I don't make money on social media. You, you, I can prove I don't make money. Where am I making money? Yeah. I don't sell anything. I don't have a course. I don't need... I, don't, I tell everybody... You should see how active I am in my comments. I'm like, please don't gamble. Please don't give me your money. Please stop asking me. I'm yeah. not doing this for... you. Like, so it's very, very obvious I don't make money on this. So like... What incentive do I have to try to incentivize these people? And then like, what incentive did they have to all collaborate the exact same lie? It's crazy. Yeah. Or I won a million bucks for Mike Malak and Logan Paul and Ryan Garcia live on the air. You know what I mean? I, I won for a little baby. We filmed it. I won for Tusi. We filmed it. YK Osiris. We filmed it. You know, uh, uh, it, it, the story's gone. Uh, 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 um, uh, Lil Keed, shout out Lil Keed. Rest in peace, bro. I love you so much. He was live on the air many times telling the stories about me winning for him like why you know like why would all you know all of these people like for what you know what i mean like um and why hasn't a single casino that I, i've told all these casinos to suck my dick you know and i post about it and i embarrass them i embarrass the heck out of these casinos why hasn't one ever came forward and said it's not true right yeah <clears throat> yeah that makes, um, I mean, it's a, it's a very cantankerous situation between you and the casinos. Uh, can you go eat wherever you want now? Is nah, there... I got, there's only two casinos cur now, updated list. There's only two casinos in the city I'm allowed to. Uh -huh. The thing is, though, there are a lot of casinos that will pretend they don't know I'm there until I do something. to a, Like if I'm going to a restaurant, they will just turn a cheek. Yeah. Let them in, let them eat, let them leave. There's some casinos that as soon as I get out of my car, casino is walking towards my car. Like, don't even, don't yeah. even get out of the car. Yeah. You know, so there's like all different ranges and it really depends on the relationship I had with the casino. And the thing is that they've never really dealt with someone like me. Out of the four of us in history that have been banned, two... Four guys have been banned for Baccarat. Yeah, well, three men, one female. But okay. yes, uh, the male and the female, um, you know, all this is public information, but the male and the female did... A technique that the that was similarly related to ca counting cards in blackjack, and the casino said, "We don't like this. We think it's illegal, and we're not paying you, and you're banned." Right? So that's two of them. In my opinion, totally acceptable, totally acceptable. But let's just pretend that they broke a rule. Let's pretend. Yeah. So two of them broke the rule. <clears throat> There's another guy who I don't know his story. I know his name, and I looked into it like a little bit, but I never like really cared. Honestly, I never really cared. Yeah. I don't really, really know his story, so he's out. And then there's me, right? So they've never actually dealt with a scenario if a guy consistently and regularly, not just beating Blackjack, but beating it for the amount, um, Baccarat, I'm sorry, but beating it for the increments I am. Now, I'm very close with a bunch of people who are lifetime winners gambling, and they stay under the radar. And I'm in these Baccarat groups. There's secret Baccarat classes, and there's like networks of people all over the planet, from every corner of the planet. We're all constantly in touch and working on, hey, this casino in this city, in this country, has this scenario, it's winnable. Hey, this casino in this city in this country just changed something, it's not winnable, and et cetera. And we all communicate and we all work on similar strategies. The truth is, I don't need their strategy, I have my own. But I'm in the communication, I'm watching it happen. So there's teams of people, very similar to the movie 21 with MIT, right? And I know, and I, and I, a little bit I know those guys. But very similar to that, there are networks of teams of ga winning gamblers around the planet. Uh, but uh, yeah, man, I'm just, uh, 
winning often and huge increments. And in the very beginning of this all happening, me and my team said, do we want to stay under the radar and go a long time? Or do we want to hit them as hard and fast as we can and we'll take it where it takes us? Yeah. And I said, we're going to go hard, fast and take it where it takes us. And this is where it took us. There you go. Yeah. Beautiful. Brandy, do you have anything else coming up? We have a lot of stuff coming up, but I don't, I don't like to talk, talk on it. Can I see? Am I going to see you on Friday? This Friday? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yes, yeah, yep. Okay, all right, for sure. I'm gonna be, <laughs> I'm gonna be. What are we? I'm doing judging the the what, the final round of yes, the bikini contest. I can talk about that. I've got like bigger things in the works. We don't yeah, until it happens. That's gonna be some madness. There're gonna be people crying. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited to see all the crying. I'm excited. Yeah, for sure. Also, I want to add on to my shout out to my girlfriend. She texted me, and Brandy can tell you the truth. She's very, very hot. Okay. She's very hot. There you go, Brandy. Brandy. will tell you the truth. That's nice. He's loyal and buckled down now. Is I'm buckled down now. We're is, all that, just... is that different for both of you? Is that what is that like just being buckled down, not belonging to the streets? You knew I uh, last podcast we had, I told you I didn't want to be in the streets. So yeah. now I'm not, and I'm ha- I'm completely happy with it. Um yeah. with him. It's like Yeah, wait, wait, I'm, here. I'm proud of him. I'm very proud of him. He's been doing really, really well. And he comes to me for advice and tips like, hey, is this normal? Is this okay? Is this not okay? And I have to like, that's not something you're supposed to do if you're being loyal to your girlfriend. <laughs> and he's like, okay, like, he's learning, he's trying. <laughs> First time in my life, you know. There you go. So I'm catching up, though. Listen, care. man, it's hard, man. It's hard to train us. I tell you, man, it is really hard to domesticate us sometimes, you know. And, you know, out here on the streets, we, we miss you guys. You guys are gone. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, from the streets, we noticed you, you guys aren't here with us anymore. Yeah, you know, uh, real quick, if there's any comedians that are watching this podcast, just know the truth about me. Something that's never been seen is I just want to be funny on the Internet. There you All go. All the rest of this stuff is kind of garbage to me. Okay, well, let's yeah. make some TikTok videos. Yeah, yeah. Let's I want to be funny. T- let's I make some TikTok funny. videos on Friday, okay? <laughs> yeah. we'll okay. I'm not, cool. Oh, you're not going to be here. No. no, no, I'm gonna be in LA. All right, all right, guys, awesome, man. Oh, I, actually, I'll probably see you at Bulls. Uh, no, Bulls I'm sorry, at uh, uh, Fleischman's birthday. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, he has a charity ball on Sunday. Him and Dave Garden. Yeah, I'm, that's where I'm gonna be. Yeah, on Sunday. Yeah, and yeah, no, on Monday is his birthday party, okay. but it's at a secret location that I'm not even supposed to say. By the time this comes out, it'll it'll already have happened. Um, all right, guys, man, thank you guys so much for coming out. This was really interesting. We went into a lot of different directions. I, I wanted to ask you more about the psychology stuff, just because I hadn't heard anybody talk about that, and I like the lascivia stuff. Like it's cool but like I can't be Adam 22 like he's gonna he's gonna ask his thing and I'm gonna ask you know something different I am interested uh, also the mathematical part of it it is very hard you understand for a lot of people that no matter what you say they're going to have a hard time believing that you can win at gambling but you did explain you think well you're kind of using their edge against them so that makes some sense um, but yeah that's awesome man where can we find you you can find me on Instagram at dirty goth boy you can mm-hmm. find me on TikTok at dirty goth boy and same name dirty goth boy for YouTube where did the name dirty goth boy come from where did, the, where did that start like the day that I decided to start social media, I was having like a, a, like a tattoo party in one of the villas and it was like a mob of like the homies and everyone's like a tattoo artist or like in a band or something. And we all like, you know, just like dirty, grungy dudes, like wear like stained clothes and somebody just came. I think it was actually, um, I think it was Josh Larkin. So shout out Josh Larkin's tattoo artist based here in Las Vegas. I think he actually came up with that term. Like we should be the dirty goth boys. And the thing was, like, he was so wasted. I was like, he's not going to remember. So let me just lock this in before I, <laughs> before I forget. And I locked it in, and that's it, you know? Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Brandy, where can we find you? Brandy the Andrews on every platform. Nice. Except for TikTok, because I have to make so many of them. I don't even know what my name is on there anymore. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. Just uh, go on there and pretend you're a dude. They'll be, they won't ban you at all. Oh, we already talked about that. Yeah. yeah I'm going to put my do. next time. Uh, and I, I got a bunch more clips with you that we're going to be posting, so you can oh, you can bad. post those as well. Hey, man, thank you guys for coming on. I try to go in as many different directions as I can. I have got some really, really wild guests uh, coming on in the next couple of weeks. I'm trying to keep this as interesting as possible. Thank you guys for coming on this journey with me. Like I said, I'm holding on by my fingernails. Thank you for all the growth, uh, all, all the reviews I'm getting on uh, uh, Spotify and um an Apple podcast, and uh, man, I, I'm telling you, man, on, on Reels and TikTok, some of the things you guys have been writing me are really, 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 really inspirational. So I want to say thank you, guys. Um, I'm just doing this uh, with as much gratitude as I can. And uh, man, things are things have been happening so fast in the last four weeks. I can't, my my brain is melting. Uh, so thank you guys for coming on this journey. I promise you, I am not going to disappoint. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to have some um, some pretty big explosions, uh, and I will see you guys next week.